everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast, where we spill tea and spin the jams. And today, Raya, Ily, and I are coming at you with a very special episode, a discography breakdown on what has come to be one of my personal favorite bands basically ever at this point and riley is of course a longtime fan of this yeah. band as he is with most bands we talk about but i would say that this is the premier musical discovery that i have made this year which is of course post-rock giants the icelandic band sigaros uh english translation victory rose indeed yeah, so one of the most beloved, well-known bands to emerge out of the post-rock wave of the late 90s, and one of the few bands, I think, to really ascend from that little branch of alternative music, nerd music, and become kind of like a household name in the 2000s. An incredibly special band to me. And like One of the interesting things about Siguros is I feel like most people who you know, most people who are really into music discover Sigur Rós fairly early on. Uh, that's just the universal story that I've gathered from all the, you know, feedback and all the things that I've seen, uh, the, the stories that people have told about this band. So when I found out that Jake was not really familiar with them, despite being, you know, around the same age as me and basically as into music as I am, it was really, it was surprising, but it was also kind of delightful as well because you get to see someone respond to this titanic fixture of, you know, the the stage of getting into music that they just, for whatever reason, never came across. And um, it, it, it's exciting. It's also kind of daunting because you think, well, maybe because, you know, some with some bands, it's like if you miss the boat, then it can be really difficult getting on the hype wave. Uh, later on in your life because you just weren't there at that pivotal time they weren't there to kind of at that formative era when you were really forming your taste as they were for me but nevertheless Jake fell head over heels uh, for them as I'm sure you'll talk about when we discuss these records so as soon as I found out that that was the dynamic that we were going to have that you know I huge longtime fan of this band one of the biggest influences on my taste of music and Jake only just getting to them now but totally falling head over heels i knew it would make for a great dynamic for a discog video so that we have to do this for starters it's a reasonably compact discography incredibly consistent uh, i don't think there's any real low points or i don't think there will be any real major hot takes in this video either like it is uh i mean with Se a band like Seguros, like the hottest take you can have is oh i like this album better than this album but they're both great uh, so that's yeah. the kind of dynamic that we're probably going to be approaching this with more or less, but we will try to talk about what distinguishes these records. I think we do have slightly different preferences. I know for a fact that we have uh, a different favorite album from this band and maybe even a different second favorite for all I know, who knows? Uh, I don't know Jake's album ranking and Jake doesn't know my album ranking. So we'll see how that goes as we discuss these albums. But yeah, Sigur Rós, a fixture of, I think every music fan's, falling in love with music more or less and um because i think in a lot of ways they are a great gateway band in the same way that a lot of like seminal prog bands are like pink floyd for instance or even just radiohead <clears throat> to bring it back to more kind of conventional alt rock they're kind of a gateway band in a certain sense that they offer they offer enough that's going to be familiar to you in terms of like musical construction and build up and pay off and all the kind of fundamental aspects of music that we respond to offers enough of that to be feel familiar but then gives you something a little bit different you know the alien tones that the band have like the completely foreign and entirely enticing vocals of Yonzi and the unique way in which he plays his guitar the amazing ethereal atmosphere and mystery surrounding this band i mean it's difficult for us now to appreciate that but when Sigur Rós first came about in the late 90s they were shrouded in mystery i mean this was a uh the internet was in its infancy and the internet certainly wasn't the main medium through which music was traveling quite yet 
So they were a mysterious collective. They had an air of foreignness about them, not just in terms of obviously not being from uh, the UK or America, but in the sense that they felt like they were beamed in from an interstellar planet. And it wasn't really until their second album that we'll get to eventually where they started to really explode and these sorts of hushed whispers that they would be spoken about and would start to escalate. But um, they are human beings. And so I'll introduce the band. They were formed in 1994. The two original members of the band that formed it were guitarist, vocalist, Yonzi, and bassist, George Holm. Uh, the band quickly recruited their first drummer, August Avar Gunnarsson, and their longtime keyboardist and general wizard, uh, Kjartan Svensson, came along a bit later as well. And we'll talk about that introduction too, as well as their longtime uh, drummer, Ori Pal Dirison, who joined in 99 as well. But as the band began, it was really Yonzi, it was George, and it was August. And they were very much in the realm of dreamy drony music in the early period i mean you have to remember that what we would come to associate with the conventional textures and the stereotypical musical idea of post-rock was not really all that developed in 1994 1994 post-rock was it was whatever the fuck talk talk were doing it was bark psychosis it was all these really kind of moody ethereal bands i mean you of course had slint on the more extreme side of the scale but Post-rock was then, and I think still remains, a weirdly difficult genre to define and pin down. And often people, when they refer to it, refer to one particular aesthetic idea of it that might be vastly different to someone else's. So, for instance, the Bach psychosis and the tortoise post-rock is very, very different to the Sigur Rós, the Godspeed You Black Emperor, that sort of post-rock, which really came to fruition in the late 90s. And so we will start this little discussion by talking about this band's first album, 1997's Vaughn, an incredibly unassuming debut. It was released on in June of 1997, just a couple of months after I was born, in fact, already echoing these ethereal alien vibes with its very i guess mysterious looking album cover of this infant's face that's just kind of like uh suspended mildly terrifying it it, it looks a bit like if you're familiar with uh the the third harry potter movie there's a scene <laughs> where sirius black's face pushes towards the camera in a little vision that Harry has and it's like got all this light refracted off of the center and I can never shake that whenever I look at this yeah well it's a very eerie image and it is actually an image I believe of Yonzi's younger sister whom the band was named after her name is of course Sigur Rós Victory Rose, and was actually born a few days before the band was initially formed and if you think about the scope of instrumental music at this time, you know, post-rock being this weird, unfixed land of experimentations and minimalism for the most part, it was not at all associated with the massive crescendoing builds that it would come to be associated with. And Icelandic music was nowhere really near this kind of far out aesthetic thing as well. I mean, they were initially signed by the same label that represented the Sugar Cubes, Björk's initial band as well. And of course, Björk being the hugest name in, in Icelandic music internationally at this point anyway, uh, very much uh, a musical scene associated with her pop eccentricities. And it was in fact interesting to read on the Wikipedia page that they were initially signed by that Sugar Cubes label, Bad Taste, because the label thought that Yonzi's falsetto vocals would appeal to teenage girls and would appeal to that younger market that a lot of the music industry in Europe were courting at that particular time. Um, but if you take one listen to their first album, Von, you could be very easily forgiven for not exactly seeing the vision there. I mean, it is a very ethereal and eerie record. It does have moments where you can think of like, okay, this is 
you know, an ethereal, dreamy band's version of a pop song. I think of songs like uh, Mirker and Cinder Goods, which are super, super slow divey when I listen to them, especially Mirker, which I think is one of the standouts of the record. I mean, that to me is just like an early slow dive song uh, or like a slow dive knockoff type of thing where it's this very ethereal dream pop thing, heavily hazy atmosphere. But also moments like that are sandwiched between long sections of eerie drone i mean there's it's about 15 20 minutes into the record before you really get discernible melody of any form and it does kind of linger in this haze it's quite lo-fi you could probably understand that i I mean i imagine it was recorded on a budget but i mean jake what are your impressions and thoughts of this minimalist and eerie beginning for this band I think it's very telling that I kind of had to come to you when I first listened to this discography and be like, hey, what's this album's deal? Because, like, I've never heard, like, I didn't even technically know that it existed until I, like, actually looked at their entire discography and was just like, oh, hey, look at that. Well, also, you could be forgiven because their second album, the English translation of its title is A Good Beginning. So it's like you would assume and I'll get to that in a bit, that they were kind of intending for the slate to start there. Um, But no, Vaughn does still exist. I I was just kind of like, okay, what's the deal with this? And then I saw it's, you know, relatively um, muted, let's say, reception. I think this is easily the most uh, lukewarmly received release from the band, shall we say. Um, So I was a bit hesitant in approaching it just because... Uh, yeah, it's the first album it doesn't have a great reputation and I do enjoy this album uh, for what it's worth I would say it's a bit of a a struggle overall it's very much a prototype for their sound uh, the production isn't what I would call bad in its sort of lo-fi fuzziness but it does hold everything back uh the i think the most standout instrumental quality of this album is the kind of thick heavy rumbling bass that just occasionally swallows these tracks and kind of just like vibrates your headphones like it can be really disarming to just be taken off guard by that particular quality of it occasionally um but other instrumental presences on this album feel comparatively kind of thin and kind of lack depth. There's cool ideas here, like the seamless transitions between tracks that often take place. Uh, and they, they this sort of hints at a very, very like sinister and sort of different emotional tone that they wouldn't explore, I think, until much, much later in their career. An idea that they just don't really return to with a sort of darkness that these droney elements can return to. Um, And and I I think that that's interesting to see being in the roots of their sound. But overall, I I can say that the, the biggest enemy of the record, other than the production, is the fact that it is 72 god damn minutes long so if you are not like totally in the bag for this band already you could potentially be sitting through an experience that you get very very little out of i personally like some of the dronier elements here i like the more electro acoustic vibe of a lot of the instrumentation but i can't say that this album benefits from being within a discography of albums that simply do a lot of what it does much better than it. Yeah, well, for starters, the title of the album, Bon, is the Icelandic word for hope. And so there is a sense with which this is tinged with, I guess the band is sort of reaching to realize something they can't quite finally realize yet. It's interesting to note as well that it took them over two years to record this. Um, they had significant issues getting it to sound the way that, first of all, the songs originally sounded when they demoed them and the way that they wanted them to sound as well. And apparently, according to their Wikipedia page, at the very least, the band were on the verge of scrapping this entire thing, but decided that that wouldn't be worth it for all the time they had put into it. So 
it is and, and what's really really interesting is that they couldn't even afford to pay the studio to record this because they had no money so they were allowed to use the studio if they painted it <laughs> so they essentially got to record this <laughs> album as a favor um and so you can tell that it very much has those sorts of growing pains. One thing I think that's particularly notable, and we'll kind of come back to this a bit later on, is that two of the songs on this record were later re-recorded and for 2007's Farf EP. And you can, if you compare the two, the versions of those songs on this record, those songs, of course, being Half Soul and the title track to the versions that appear on Farf, you can tell, I mean, they're light years apart from each other. They're almost unrecognizably Very. different. They've com been completely uh, refitted and reformed. So uh, I think that gives an idea of, I imagine the versions of those songs that you hear on Farf are what they kind of would have wanted this entire record to sound like with all of these tracks. I was reminded uh, to some extent of early Animal Collective, weirdly enough, listening to this. Their first two albums, specifically, Spirit They're Gone, Spirit They're Vanished, and Dance Manatee. I was going to say, Dance Manatee was actually something that I thought of while listening to this, because I was just like, boy, this certainly has the sort of rougher, abrasive qualities that that album has that probably led to a alienating a lot of people when they like went back to discover it retroactively. Yeah, absolutely. And I... It was like particularly just this kind of moments there were there was a tribal feeling that this record gives off something kind of earthly and kind of dirty and brewing i think in tracks like virulde nai ug ud and um the earlier tracks like dorgan and hundjord um yes i have been practicing these moments... i haven't so please do not <laughs> massacre me for getting these pronunciations wrong I, i'm, I'm probably American. still getting them wrong <laughs> so you know i'm sure I'm you happy to will get them more together. right than me but yeah there are moments where you get a kind of earthly sort of elemental feeling coming through that i feel like is maybe the record's biggest strength and particularly like contrast with moments like if you go think about the transition from lit ad lifi into mirica like it's like going from darkness to light so there's moments like that that are quite effective i do think that the strongest moment aside from mirica is the title track which has this really lovely sort of like twinkly tone to it that i think is somewhat hindered by the production sound overall but really does come to the fore when it's re-recorded eventually it doesn't help that the record ends with six minutes of silence before yes. you then get a segment of the song mirica played in reverse for no apparent reason uh other than i guess they thought it sounded the album cool. wasn't long enough already <laughs> i guess so yeah it's a bit of a mixed bag uh leaning more towards disappointing and unengaging although i do weirdly i find myself kind of transfixed by like the first 15 minutes of eerie drone when the record starts weirdly enough that's some of the most compelling music here just in terms of the vibe and atmosphere that it captures yeah. the eeriness it feels like something in interstellar space being kind of born like it has this kind of big bang sort of feeling to it but slow motion but yeah apart from that it's really just uh moments on songs like mirica cinder goods and uh, the aforementioned Half Soul and Vaughn, where you get a real sense of the band's talent coming through a little bit. But I mean, one thing that's worth noting as well is that I believe this is the only Sigur Ross album that doesn't feature uh, keyboardist Kartan Svensson, uh, who is such a pivotal figure of their sound as well. So that could be a part of the reason why this record doesn't quite hit the mark as well as the band hadn't quite fully found their ultimate lineup, let's just say as well. I also think um, I'll shout out one of my more favorite moments, which is a Hyun Joro, uh, the third track on here, which is sort of the first real coherent musical moment on there. And I, like you do, enjoy the drone, but it also like, it sort of feels like an album that really, I honestly think this album would be far better remembered if it was maybe like cut in half and then like just arranged into some of its more evocative parts if you just sort of put that together even though it is lo-fi even if it is rough and even though it has some uh like it doesn't contain some more uh, essential components of their later records it still does feel like an experience and a bit of a 
sort of a landmark pioneer in post-rock because like again even though this isn't the final form of this band and it isn't a particularly beloved release this is back in 94 and this took them two years to record what sounded like this in 1992 and 1993 nothing yeah no i agree i will also say as well um i didn't haven't really had enough time to uh listen to this in much depth but i'll also say as well the band did release a remix album uh for this record uh the right, year a year right. after called von brigdy and i've i've delved into it a little bit i haven't listened to it in full uh i will issue the i guess potentially somewhat hot take that i think the remix album is a little bit better and more interesting than the original record it's certainly because mm. it's a remix album it's less cohesive and it plays less well together as a single flowing piece of music but i think that it is interesting um not significantly better but it has moments that i enjoy there is most notably there is a remix of the song send your goods by the band mum which are one of the most famous icelandic bands a kind of indie tronica post folk post rock band that uh were quite big in the late 90s and the early 2000s and i always think of them alongside Sega ross even though what they do is more electronic and slightly more different and there's also a cool remix of the title track by gus gus which is a, a real remember some guys icelandic electronica band that my dad used to be super super into yeah it's it, it exists it's there if you want to be a completist i recommend checking it out the most interesting thing is that uh, the title von Brigdi uh, is the Icelandic word for disappointment. Uh, so <laughs> the original album is called Hope and then the remix album is called Disappointment, which I just find to be a funny little bit of a joke. This is a band that I think has a really good sense of humor about themselves, maybe something that is less talked about. And they do play with their image and they do also quite a lot play with expectations and ideas of what sort of band they're perceived to be, especially in the 2000s, what sort of band they're pigeonholed as. And they like to react against that quite a bit. The alternate uh, title for uh, a good beginning or the alternate translation is an all right start. All right, as in like pejorative, basically, which yeah. I think is really funny. Yeah, and that does bring us to their second album, 1999's Agaitis Version, uh, or A Good Beginning. Uh, this is essentially regarded generally as where Sigur Ross starts as a cultural entity, as a post-rock band, uh, and, and particularly as a fixture of the imaginations and minds of millions of people across the globe. This is... I mean, it really can't be impressed. This is something I've had to learn about retroactively, obviously, because I was two when this album came out. But this was beguiling and mysterious. And the entire world, at least the music world, was captivated by this when it came out. And no one knew who the hell Sigur Ross even were. This was just kind of like this transmission that was beamed down and sounded nothing like anything else that had ever been made up to that point i mean you think about the post-rock that existed in 1999 basically all of it was fucking dark and depressing as shit was morose mm -hmm. was downtrodden and sigi ross were coming in here and doing something that now seems like a cliche to us but at the time was a novelty which was making post-rock beautiful making beautiful instrumental music that made you want to you know, run across a field or, you know, steer into the sun and blind yourself. It just music that made you feel all of these really, really, really intense things. Uh, in a lot of ways, it's this is definitely me doing a reach and it's me doing a very Riley Cool reference point. In a lot of ways, Sigur Ross to me are kind of like an emo band in some respects like they don't have many of the signifiers of emo but like or the aesthetics of emo but like in terms of the way the music is used and what the music means to the people that it means the most to it functions in a way that i don't think is very dissimilar to emo music at all i totally agree honestly this album came like a bolt from the blue uh completely blew up the world of music culture as well 
it quickly gained exposure in Iceland. It did really well on the Icelandic charts. Uh, and then it kind of spread. It was kind of a re- an early example of an album spreading and making its way through to the West, I guess, or making its way through to America through message boards and through like blogs and through just word of mouth, essentially, that kind of lifted it up to this you know, thing that was spoken about in hushed tones. And of course, you have to remember that this was an era where albums weren't released everywhere at the same time, uh, especially if your album is coming from some wacko weirdo place in the middle of Iceland, right? Most albums, in fact, not pre- basically all albums at this time were released in different countries at different times. And if you were living in a country where the album hadn't been released yet, and you might not have any idea when it would be released either, you might have no way of hearing this. Or in this really nascent internet era age, you might hear it through, you know, rips, like really low quality MP3 rips that would get posted on a blog, for instance. And so you would have to really work hard to listen to something that was spreading by word of mouth from a place like Iceland. And you had to essentially use word of mouth to kind of push record labels to buy uh, the rights to release these albums from whatever Icelandic label they're on to whatever US label wanted to and could afford to buy it uh, and, and release it and spread it out. So it wasn't actually until the next year, 2000, that this album was released in the UK and it didn't even make it to America until, until 2001. Uh, so this album was spread by word of mouth and leaked MP3s and all these sorts of things that were essentially creating this massive buzz around this mysterious band that no one in the West or wherever really knew all that much about. And that, I think, has contributed in a huge way to the kind of mystique and obsession and sort of cult of hush tones that surrounds this record, especially when you think about how it presents itself as well. I mean, if you imagine it as the world's introduction to this mysterious band and it's weird warped backwards tones and it's these kind of wordless crooning vocals and these guitar sounds that are like elongated and bowed and like literally played with a bow and just these long songs that just go on and on and on and basically extended ambient soundscapes for the most part that occasionally will blossom into something huge and explosive. I mean, there was nothing else like it in the world, and it was an absolute revelation. Uh, of course, as I mentioned or alluded to before, this is the first album the band released with keyboardist Kjartan Svensson, uh, the last album they made with their first drummer, August Ivar Gunnarsson, and the four-piece, essentially, the these four men making this record, it, it has this fullness to it where each of them are contributing in really powerful and potent ways even if the drummer is doing something slightly more subtle and the bassist is just providing a really sort of static bed there's a lot of textural stuff happening here and it's so immaculately beautifully produced as well that it kind of just took the world by storm Jake, what are your overall thoughts on this particular record, how it builds off of that first record, and also the sound of this thing and the experience of listening to it? I think it's important to contextualize it as you have through being one of those dawn of the internet albums, because I also feel like the music of Sigur Rós is perfectly built to be like this golden goose once you discover it like once you go about finding this music and it being so alien and foreign to you and and strange sounding that it just it makes the journey that you had to take in those earlier days to find music like this feel like it was actually a reward that was like you know worth undertaking so i think that a lot of the the mystique around this was built around a sort of experience that might be a bit difficult to appreciate nowadays now that everything is a little bit more immediate but even then this is an album that almost feels wholly not wholly unlike but very dissimilar to basically everything that would come after it and I think that goes from like it being a sort of sonic evolution from the debut record 
and kind of a crystallization of what they wanted to do in terms of like instrumental identity and the sort of the formation of this mm. oncoming wave of, of genre stuff. And as such, it is a deeply emotional, cathartic, and immensely overwhelming experience. Mm. And I must admit, this overwhelming quality the album does have is both singularly arresting and also something that does lead me personally to kind of view this from a bit of a distance. I don't know whether to call this the quietest loud album of all time or the loudest quiet album of all time. <laughs> um, I feel like you can simultaneously call it both. And in any given moment, it sort of just feels like whatever is happening instrumentally on any song here is just like it it does feel like staring into the sun it, it feels like you are going to like have your retinas melted uh in a good way mostly like for example uh sleepwalking angels i i love how the kind of um which is the the first proper song on here which is not the actual name of it but i'm going to use the english names because it's easier that there's like a sonar blip at the start of this song and it's like and there's sort of an echo that sort of resonates throughout the rest of the track and it's got this absolutely lovely sound um there's an obvious refinement from the debut uh jonesy's vocals are just fantastic and there's certain signifiers that i think great vocal presences in music have that almost becomes like mimetic to them um i i often associate like the uh the harmony of woos on a King Gizzard track um, might, might be one such idea. The the particular uh, thing I would attribute to Jonesy would just be the... Um, <clears throat> you will hear that a lot. <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. It is fantastic every single time. Uh, so uh, don't you worry, his falsetto is gorgeous. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the trademarks of this band. The only thing I will say about this album that I think is legitimately a, a bit of a weak point for me, and this does have to do with the fact that this was not the first album from this band that I listened to. I listened to their later work before I listened to this. So that informs a lot of the perspective that I'm attacking this band with overall. So keep that in mind. But this album does kind of lack a bit of the dynamism that I find so inherently compelling about the rest of their records. There is a bit more of the like loud, quiet dynamic as soon as like the next record, which I think is almost essential to like just how great at raw composition they become. And there is plenty of skill being demonstrated here. I think a lot of what sort of is epitomized of my feelings is actually the uh, third proper song, which translates to Fly Savior. This track, it immediately showcases a bit more like expressive vocals from Yonzi, and it feels a little bit more like aggressive at the sort of beginning there. Uh, very like forward in the mix and the way they haven't been before. It's very refreshing in the context of the discography to hear him like singing like this, in fact. It's got this really great, subtle, groovy bass line. And it's also got these like pretty ethereal accents here, but it sort of displays why this isn't the like, and, and, I, and I really do feel the need to emphasize the fact that I do think this album is great. Uh, and it's difficult just because this is like literally one of the most beloved albums ever made. So I, I feel like I am fighting an uphill battle here um, whenever I am throwing a criticism at it. But it's a bit um load blowy to, to sort of contextualize what that exactly means is that it's like purely 100% concentrated orgasmic bliss for the entire runtime of the record. And that's great, but it just sort of rides out a very specific high for its runtime that's very immediate, but doesn't leave me super eager to return to it, even though it's great. Like, it, not a lot of the structure of these songs keeps me as invested as some of the other stuff here. But rest assured, there are stuff like, for example, um, uh, New Batteries, uh, I love the quieter horn sections on here. I think that adds a real spice 
to the the mm. sound of the band the the really serene start here i also very much appreciate the drums create a very present rhythmic element here that was just not really present before like before it was just like the drums are big and loud and they're going to fucking kill you and now the drums feel like a little bit more of a backbone in this particular song here it's like listening to like a large machine slowly start and begin to work after like thousands of years of not being used the mechanical kind of ambient noises uh kind of help with that uh and there's also kind of like a jazzy horn at the end there's a lot of different ideas being thrown at the board here and there's also what's maybe i think my favorite song on here which translates to the amusing title a good weather for an airstrike uh i yeah. love the piano and the strings uh. that eventually yield these like bluesy guitar licks gorgeous stuff yonzi's vocals just kind of drift into the ether it's 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 fucking amazing one of the best songs they ever made yeah i completely agree and it's interesting you bring that song up as well so i would say i mean there's a number of songs on this record that are kind of iconic in their own right and this sort of brings me to one of the essential aspects of how Sigur Ross became one of the biggest bands in the world, aside from just the music itself, but it was the way that they licensed their music to be used in films. Now, if you speak to anyone yeah. who got into Sigur Ross in the 2000s, at any point in the 2000s, you ask them, how did you discover this band? The vast majority of the time, I suspect, you will hear a reference to a film of some kind. Yep. The first major track here Svefn G Inglar Sleepwalking Angels as you said before to me this is like one of the post-rock songs like this is this song is like iconic uh it's in the movie Vanilla Sky uh and it's far from the only Siguros song to feature in that movie and this is kind of like I want to just zero in on this song for a minute because this is an absolute top three song of this band's for me the the moment in this song so you mentioned that kind of like radar sound that starts in the intro track and then kind of continues in through this it's like some interstellar beam is discovering some like life force and it's essentially booting up and rearing to life in the song and i've mentioned as well the particular technique with which john z plays his guitar where he uses a cello bow um, to get these really long, heavy, loud, continuous tones out of the guitar as he plays it. The moment in this track when those tones come in, and it sounds like the loudest thing you've ever heard in your life. It sounds like a blue whale that is having its call uh -huh. amplified times a thousand. It is the hugest sound in music. And that moment is like, I've heard this song hundreds of times. I still get chills when that boat guitar comes in and it makes that enormous sound. And the song itself spends its 10 minutes luxuriating in that atmosphere, especially the also the melodic slash key change where the song kind of switches up in its second half and Yonzi's vocals get a little bit more intense and a little bit more kind of um, brittle as opposed to that beautiful kind of cooing. That shit sends me out of the stratosphere. Completely amazing. Uh, and then you have a song like Stadelfer, the uh, second proper song here, Steering Elf, uh, which is probably one of the most iconic songs or recognizable songs in the record. It was used in uh, Wes Anderson's film, The Life Aquatic. Uh, it was used in a number of TV shows. It was used in a number of commercials. This song was everywhere in the 2000s. That particularly iconic kind of little looping piano refrain that's kind of processed to sound like a rainbow somehow, like a beam of sunlight. The strings that kind of just echo and, and surge at certain parts of this the weird horn parts that come in at certain parts of it and the acoustic guitar part about three quarters in that gives it this kind of folksy feel alongside the horns that's another aspect that the band kind of lean into in certain moments i'd say more as this record goes on is this kind of rootsy kind of folksy feel it kind of embodies its environment, this kind of volcanic landscape of affable people who, you know, everyone kind of knows each other. And there's this kind of familial feeling. That's something that comes to define Sigur Ross records later on, especially records like Tuck and Midsuri Iterum, 
is this kind of sense of communal joy and like rich familial connection and that comes through in the moments that are a bit more folksy in this record um like Olsen Olsen for instance which is another one of the more iconic moments in this record where you have these sorts of like this looping melodic refrain that gets kind of swells up and gets kind of blown into the stratosphere by this massive horn section and these very kind of uh what I describe as sort of very northern European sort of like male choir vocals that sound like a bunch of you know uh barbershop quartet or something it's it's nuts it's beautiful stuff and you get like as well you get curveball moments on this record like Hyartar Hamast the heart pounds which is this kind of more groovy jazzy sort of much more keyboard and bass heavy song that adds these extra unusual textures and kind of gives the record a little bit more spice at a moment where it really needs it and then you get to the the song that uh Another song, because it's hard to pick favorites. My favorite's absolutely Svefinger Ingvar and Vidrar Veltil Loftarasa, which itself had an iconic music video, by the way, which was a huge part of the band essentially being discovered overseas, this music video kind of being played. But the other song that I love to dearly, dearly to death, is the title track here, An All Right Start, uh, Agatis Birgen. Great this, song. This is a, I mean, this is an immaculate eight minute song. We recently talked about a completely unrelated album, but we recently talked about the Nationals Alligator on this show. Um, and it has the best song on that record, The Geese of Beverly Road, is the song that has this sense of nostalgia and kind of wistful joy. And it kind of goes on this journey across its runtime and it ends back where it started. And this song on this record has a very similar feel to me. It has this homeliness to it. It has this comfort. It has this beautiful sense of gentle progression that it goes on and then eventually returns back home. It's one of the most modest songs on here. The piano playing is like it's processed to sound a little bit electronic, but also really, really hard hitting all the same too. Yonzi's vocals are a little bit more intimate and just kind of restrained, but also quite beautiful as well. There's little touches of acoustic guitar as well. It feels like the record is kind of just coming down from this massive extended swell that it's been on that you've, I think, quite fairly described the overall sound as being like. And it's just the perfect way to kind of bring this record back to earth. I mean, the moment where the song ends and you just have this like tiny little hum from Yonzi he sounds smaller than he's ever sounded after a whole record of sounding like this massive alien titan. He just ends in this place of, of just contentment and peace. And then the record gives you the... Uh, moody outro of Avalon, which I think is just the opening track slowed down extremely like the intro track just slowed wow. down um to like a uh, a very very slow pace and then kind of maybe some effects thrown on there or something uh it's a beautiful little ending to the record it's kind of like a more successful execution of how they tried to end their first album but yeah it's i think i can definitely see how and i, I feel this to some extent as well i can see how it's a bit of a struggle to get into this record for some people who discover them for their more kind of immediate and I would say dynamic and visceral material. And I completely relate to that, uh, especially because this was like the third album I heard and it was, you know, it took some getting into for me over the years. But I do think that from start to finish, this is one of the most immaculately paced, well flowing and kind of singularly compelling Sigur Ross records even if the kind of midsection is a little bit moodier and slower and it takes a little bit of time to kind of linger in the ambience maybe a little bit more than you might want from them if you're in that mood for the real cathartic stuff but to me it just makes the cathartic arrival of songs like Vidra and Olsen Olsen all the the better when they happen it's an amazing record. It's an immaculate record. And yeah, it has all of this hype surrounding it. It's one of the greatest albums of all time. But it's a testament to this band that the title of best album is still widely divided. And there is absolutely no consensus whatsoever. No matter what ratings you see on what websites, no one can agree on what this band's best album is. You ask 10 different Sigurd Ross fans, they will probably give you 10 different answers. Uh that's a bad way of putting it because they don't have 10 albums, but you get what I mean. I was going to say, um, I, I do get what you mean. Even even though um, 
I will say for a moment that I really do love the closer here, Avalon, in that I feel like it sort of hints at things to come and that the sort of sonic timbre of this song in particular is like immediately reminiscent of the next album that we'll get to. Yeah. And I just, it has the tone of like, I mean, th this band, given that they came up in the same sort of time and they are kind of like an internet forum band, uh, I, I think that this is sort of the motion picture soundtrack to <laughs> this particular uh, part of the record. And it just feels so it feels a little bit more sparse, but I feel like after everything that comes before it, it feels essential that you just sort of leave the listener with this sort of instilled sense of awe. And I feel like that's the sort of main quality of uh, a good beginning is that it's just, it's focused on being as big and overwhelming as humanly possible. And it, it sort of just feels like the band knew that they were getting like a, a second chance of sorts from their first record. And they were just like, okay, we have all of these tools at our disposal. Uh, let's fucking use the shit out of all of them. And you really do feel like this is the definitive statement from an artist who, or from a collection of artists who had to prove themselves and subsequently did better than most people will ever do anything. Yeah. Absolutely. And so as I've emphasized, this album had a huge impact. It was a suspended impact because of the way that it was released, where, you know, people, certain people in certain countries had to wait a long time to even be able to hear it. Uh, and it's the band were surrounded by this massive wave of kind of hype that how could any band potentially, how would you deal with that? How would you approach that? How would you move forward from that? And it wasn't until October of 2002 that their third album was released. And there's a few interesting aspects of this album that reflect, I think, how the band were dealing with this massive level of hype that was kind of put onto them, how they were approaching music in this particular era. And the reputation of this record, I think, speaks to how the band's longevity has really had the music aging particularly well. So their third album is untitled, officially. Uh, there's a number of different things that it's called. The band themselves have recurred, referred to it as Svigaplatten, which is Icelandic for the Bracket album. Uh, I'm used to calling it parentheses. Some people call it brackets. Some people just call it the untitled album, which I think is what it's been referred to in some, um, in some places as well, official places too. This is an album that when it was initially released, it had... Uh, no titles. It had that iconic uh, slip over cover with the uh, bracket symbols. I remember because my dad had the CD and it was like uh, the bracket symbols were kind of like cut out of the um, plastic essentially. And you pulled the sleeve out and revealed the full cover. And there were no track titles. There was nothing. There was like a booklet that would that came with the CD back in the era when you had CDs that had massive booklets kind of stuffed into the uh, the front side, and it was just blank pages. It was just nothing. It was just complete emptiness. Wow. Essentially, the idea I think here was to try and kind of both maintain this mystique that had surrounded the band, but also kind of poke fun at it a little bit as well. Um, and kind of just take it to this kind of ridiculous extreme. The band didn't want to title this. They didn't want to title the songs um, for a long time. I just knew them as an untitled one through eight. Although the album was eventually re-released with titles as well. Uh, each of the titles, or well, not all of them, but most of them being like the something song. Uh, like uh, the second track is amusingly translates as the first song, uh, Firsta. Yeah. Um, Sam Skeety, the Seam song, Dao Dalajid, the Death song, Pop Lajid, the Pop song, uh, and a few, and uh, Nyos Navalin, which is the Nothing song. Uh, lots of different titles that were kind of imposed afterwards on these songs by the band. And the album has a really interesting structure and progression to it that kind of makes the most out of this mystique and kind of continuous blank slate. For starters, this nothingness is emphasized by the fact that, in stark contrast to a Gatist version, there's no Icelandic spoken on this record. Uh, it is these 
re very repetitive and a very, very short number of continuous gibberish refrains, essentially, that come came to be known uh, officially as von Lenska, I think, and then pejoratively as Hopelandic, which is a very stupid term that John Z has roundly rejected. Uh, but anyway, whatever you want to call it, it's the it's just these meaningless vocalizations essentially where Yonzi is retrofitting Yonzi is I guess making his voice emphasizing his voice as an instrument or as a texture in the songs and nothing else really not really positioning himself as a singer of any kind rather just someone who is adding to the texture and progressions of these songs in the same way that any instrumentalist would it's worth noting, this is the first Sigur Ross album to feature their second drummer, Ori Pal Derison, whose presence, I think, uh, in certain tracks on this record especially, but I would say fairly consistently throughout, is very strongly felt, and we'll emphasize that on certain songs, at least I will, for, for sure. And I'm kind of going to give the game away a little bit here. This is my favorite Sigur Ross album. <laughs> I think it's, I, I've, I, it's not an unpopular pick. It's interesting, a lot at the time, a lot of kind of critics and the general reception was kind of a little bit frostier on this than the previous record. I think maybe part of that was how standoffish this album is in comparison to its previous one. Like the previous album is, I think, in a lot of ways, a bit more welcoming than this one is. This record can really linger in some sustained uh, and very dark tones for extended periods of time. And it can try the patience of people who aren't particularly keen on that mode, especially when you have these vocal refrains and repetitions being so continuous and so repetitive. Um, but to me, it creates a hypnotic quality that is never less than utterly engrossing for the entire listening experience. And because of the way that the album is so immaculately structured to feature these regular crescendos that each hit in a distinct and different way, despite structurally being fairly similar, it gives it a sense of a, of a kind of like tidal experience where you're kind of just suspended in this environment and this water or this force of nature is kind of receding from you and then it's coming and bearing down on you in the most overwhelming way possible. It's a record that has a number of little aesthetic details and techniques that really emphasize its continuousness as a piece. Uh, for starters, the fact that there were originally no song titles, it's very clear to me that the band intend this to be experienced as a single piece of music or at a push, two pieces of music because uh, on the original release, the fourth song ends with 30 seconds of silence, uh, which I think is supposed to differentiate the two halves of the records and kind of just uh, put a kind of line in between them, especially because the band have described the first half as intending to be the more kind of hopeful and brighter side and the second half as to, to be the darker and more kind of morose side. Although I think that, I mean, to me, the entire record is pretty morose. But that said, there's other structural techniques the band utilize here as well. For one, the album starts with like the click of a tape recorder being started and the album ends with the click of a tape recorder finishing, essentially, to give it this kind of like singular statement. And that's a kind of like visual, that's a kind of like audio sonic representation of the brackets. So like each of those two sounds is a open bracket, closed bracket, and then in between is the nothingness, essentially, that the album is. And... Yeah, I, I I spoke about how satisfying of a holistic singular listen their their previous album was, but to me, this is even more that. This is the fullest realization of Sigur Ross's talent at the album format for me. Uh, it's an album that is so captivating and so emotional as a listening experience that I... I can, I've never gotten tired of this. And if I, if anything, I feel like I've only gotten more and more fond of it as the years grow on. I'm very, very close to uh, awarding it a perfect score, in fact. Uh, it is a remarkable album that meant a lot to me as a kid, even if it wasn't the album that meant the most to me as a kid. We'll get to that shortly. But it is the album that I think really taught me what Sigur Ross were all about in terms of 
the power that they could wield and the artistry that they had, the 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 compositional skill that these guys were working with and that they were executing to excellence in this particular era of their career. Jake, at what point in your Sigur Ross died did you get to this album? And what was your experience like uh coming into this and then listening to this mammoth album? I listened to the final two albums in this discography first, and then after that came back around and sort of went in order. So I listened to this afterwards. And honestly, it, it's weird just because in terms of like raw sound, they're not that different. But in terms of like the approach to how they build these songs, I think that it couldn't be more different from a good beginning. And I think that it benefits from that because it forces them to operate in a lane that I think inherently has more restrictions, but forces them to make everything a bit more tight, a bit less monotone. And as a result, it creates an experience that is wholly captivating. I fucking love this record. I mean, not that... uh it's you know not that hot of a take or anything um this is like the the second most beloved record from this band uh and as you mentioned with their first album a lot of people first hear Sigur Rós in uh like films and what have you and I would be remiss not to mention uh this is a, the most Jake core of references here but uh my favorite song on here was my favorite song on here before I even heard the album, just because I had been captivated with this piece of music before. Um, and that being uh, Untitled 3, which is, I mean, a flawless piece of music, frankly. That's a that's a top tier track from the band for me. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I cannot go without mentioning its usage in Greg Araki's Mysterious Skin. Oh, this, yeah. if you know, if you know that film, and you are at all familiar with its ending and its utilization in the ending of that film, it's like impossible not to well up. It's like, I can basically hear the Joseph Gordon-Levitt monologue that happens at the end of that that's quoted directly from the Mysterious Skin novel, and I just fucking weep. Those really, really lonely-sounding piano notes at the very end here are oh god it's exquisite it's it's literally one of the most singularly beautiful things i've ever heard it's it's also one of the simplest compositions on here though it allows for a real less is more approach that i feel like the album kind of embodies and it comes to this like this subtle build the piano melody the rising strings the the slowly building drone it's all paced so flawlessly and there's like a really subtle key change in the piano at the end and from then on it's just pew, rocket over the fucking moon fucking dead baby and imax all the fucking hyperbole i can possibly throw at something like this and, and the whole rest of the album frankly is not that far removed from this piece when it comes to quality which is the most astonishing like i had a connection to that song before i even knew it was a Sigur Rós song and the the bewildering thing is that it's like oh the whole album is this good fuck mm. like it's probably uh, the most I'm... sonically unified Sigur Rós album in a certain sense that the songs yeah. like like they all fit together and they all feel of a piece with one another and that's something i've seen used to wield against it that at points it can feel kind mm -hmm. of like it drags or that it kind of wears certain ideas out but i just i, I don't feel that to me it's it's just consistently no. hypnotic and beautiful and, and really arresting it, it feels like they're using a, a a a definitely more limited palette but to achieve different effects with that it's also not the only time i think this band will play with the idea of two distinct halves of an album being very different emotionally but i do really love how like untitled one for instance really picks up on 
like right where Avalon left off on the previous record for me. Like it's a really moody refinement of some of the melancholy that was found occasionally on A Good Beginning. And the, thus feels like the first time since the, the proper debut where they're incorporating elements of that kind of sparse, dreary darkness that you could find on that record. Mm -hmm. And it's got this more it feels like adorned with a more subtle detail and structural build and this twinking, 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 wow, <laughs> twinkling, beautiful climax that uh, really comes out of left field. It feels like it like sucker punches you almost, like you don't really expect it to happen. And that's what I think is great about Sigurus is that like, and that leads to me, I think, subsequently discovering this band at like the perfect time for me is that I have so attuned my sensibilities to the world of post-rock to be very very specific and i feel like sigur Rost in a respect don't really like they don't intentionally subvert it but because they are who they are and they are from their own world and have their own influences they end up just sort of coincidentally subverting a lot of ideas that we do sort of take for granted in terms of post rock which simultaneously make it really different and refreshing but also make it really new feeling and, and like give it a sense of, of wonder and mystery and allow for it to be kind of accessible like you can understand why people sort of got into the sound other than it's just kind of alien quality it, it feels like something that is inviting and welcoming and i feel like this album feels like it just sort of allows you to kind of fill in the gaps yourself a little bit more with it. it it sort of has a more versatile emotional tone to it that like you feel like it can soundtrack various parts of like just what you experience with it and i feel like that is a key aspect of sigurosa's music um i also think that that's very much uh the case that uh with like the the final stretch of this record with uh untitled seven and eight which are two deeply underrated pieces of music honestly especially seven would being my second favorite thing on here it's like the most slow paced thing on here other than maybe like five which is like a dirge but like a good dirge um but it perfectly lulls you into this false sense of security to surprise you with some of the album's loudest crescendos and mm. droning guitars and crashing cymbals. Mm. This is as close to Godspeed You Black Emperor that this band sounds. And at the very end here, uh, I also like Jonesy's voice kind of cracks a little bit. And when it cracks, it's just like, oh, hey, that sounds like Bjork. <laughs> Like, I couldn't help but notice that. Just be like, oh, hey, that sounds like Medulla. <laughs> That's funny. And I love uh, the final track here. Oh. It's a very um, balanced ending that feels like it covers the entire emotional spectrum. It's like ominous, wondrous, grand, but like also digestible. And it feels like a really skillful employment of a lack of form in terms of song structure. And I just... Yeah, this is one of the most rewarding albums in their discography to me. And while it may be initially kind of challenging to the sensibilities that you might have been specifically very attuned to on A Good Beginning, it feels like something that is designed to last with you over a very long period of time. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I can't say enough good things about the final stretch of this record. I mean, the last song, Pop Lajid, the pop song, uh, amazing title. Uh, again that sense mm. of humor coming through that is like they close i think they still do close most of their concerts with this it is their most like beloved of the massive big long crescendo songs and the last mm -hmm. kind of three minutes of this song are like some of the loudest hardest music made by anyone ever in the history of music <laughs> like that i've ever it's heard nuts. uh particularly i want to shout out ori's drumming as well what he is doing not even just here but throughout the record as well there's like this real metallic sound to the way that he drums on this album yeah particularly in the it's like crescendo industrial. moments like what i mean by that is you can hear like the sound of like clashing metal of like just symbols being crashed and just the kit being absolutely mutilated like there's this groove that he sinks into uh in the last part of this last song 
that's so fucking sophisticated and complex for a co- post rock build up payoff that the first I remember listening to this as a kid and I was kind of like overwhelmed by it. There's certain things that I couldn't quite connect to the way the song ended because the drum part was just too sophisticated for what I would expect from <laughs> this kind of ending. Like he was, he's just doing so much shit that feels unnecessary, but adds this extra layer of of satisfying musicality to the way it ends and he's doing that throughout the record very consistently i mean the only song he doesn't really have a presence on is the third track and and that's a a smart decision because that song is powerful for how minimal it is but like even the little details there like on that song the way that the the it's a simple piano loop that just continually builds and kind of it feels like it's moving upward but it isn't really changing what's changing is the background like you have this again that bowed guitar you're getting it elongated stretched out singular guitar tones and they're getting louder and more intense and the effects that are being played on them the distortion is growing and growing and then there's that amazing moment where like you just that that piano loop just leaps up like two octaves towards the end and it's just like (laughs) just insane and uh, that shit is amazing Uh, i completely agree that is uh it's, it's probably is still my favorite song on the record as well I can't shout out enough though some of the less appreciated moments uh the opening track for one as well Vaka gorgeous beginning to the record as well again you start with that piano and it's this warm bed Uh, I think the most underrated song on this is actually the second track Fiesta I very seldom see people talking about this song but this is just like there have been so many times where it's either been unconscionably hot outside or unconscionably cold outside and either way i just put this on and i feel like the fucking saddest shit like i just feel like (laughs) like fucking terrible and i listen to this and i feel like i'm (laughs) dead i'm actually dead and it's the best soundtrack now i come back to film references to talk about the fourth song on this and your the nothing song untitled four whatever you want to call it this is the most well-known song on the record i would say I mentioned that Svif and G. Inglar was featured in Vanilla Sky. And you can kind of attribute, I think, Vanilla Sky to the massive success of this band at the moment that they received it in a lot of ways. That movie came out in 2001. So a lot of people were hearing yep. Sigur Ross in that movie before they'd even been able to hear any of their albums. And so, that soundtrack consists of so many other bands at that time whose fan base perfectly feeds into Sigur Rós's. Yeah. You have songs on there like Radiohead and shit, well, and the overlap between Radiohead fans and Sigur Rós fans, pretty fucking strong. And a big reason for that overlap as well is that they were being compared a lot at the time as well by music yeah. press. Like, when Kid A came out, all the Dead Baby IMAX shit aside, like, the biggest reference point that people were comparing that to was a Gatiss version, a good beginning, because mm-hmm. that was the only other record that existed at that time, and it was still relatively fresh in the minds of music journalists that captured the sort of grandiosity and, and alien hugeness that Kid A captured. And so Radiohead and Siggy Ross have stayed in the same conversation eternally. They've always been brought up together, especially when you consider like how they're initially thought of for their instrumental prowess, but they're actually kind of amazingly good at pop songwriting as well that's another Mm -hmm. way that they're often compared um but anyway the four untitled four right so Sif and G. Inglar are featured in Vanilla Sky but this track featured I would say even more prominently and this is probably the biggest example of uh a musical cue really introducing a band to the entire world essentially and I love the story behind uh the band agreeing to license this Uh, their music for that film uh, because it was the first film that they licensed their music for and uh, Yonzi's reasoning was because he thought the idea of Tom Cruise acting over their music was hilarious Uh, so he said (laughs) yeah sure do it Um, I mean it is very funny uh, but yeah and so then it kind of you know Mysterious Skin all these other films that and and TV shows as well that it featured and followed from that Um, but yeah I think that Untitled 4 has one of the two or three most gorgeous melodies the band had ever composed Mm -hmm. that main guitar melody that is just like seared into my brain forever it is like one of the most beautiful things i've ever heard and i just every time i hear that main melodic part come in at the kind of chorus uh while 
Yonzi is singing that you sigh alone. Uh, that's like to me one of the most perfect moments mm-hmm. in any Seguro song. And it's kind of like, I would say, maybe aside from Starlfer on the last record, the first moment where I think you get a real sense of how intuitively good Sigur Ross are at crafting pop music. Like, this isn't quite a pop song, and neither is Starlfer, but they have attributes that are quite poppy, like the way that that song is structured, the way that chorus kind of bursts in, and the way that you say a long refrain is used. It's hooky, it's catchy, it sticks in your mind. Mm-hmm. I think it's the by far the hookiest moment on this record. And it does look ahead to the band's continuing pursuit of pop music. That leads really nicely into the band's fourth album, 2005's Tuck, which is the Icelandic word for thanks. Uh, This was the first Sigur Ross album I ever heard. Uh, My dad had it on CD. I remember he bought it, the I'm pretty sure the month that it came out here. Uh, in 2005 and I also remember uh, my first ever exposure to this band which was the music video for the song Glossoli uh, which is Icelandic for glowing soul this is was then my favorite song of all time when I first heard it now admittedly I hadn't heard many songs at that point. I mean, discernible songs that I could name, probably like 50 to 100, I guess. I don't know. But this was number one for the longest time. And it's still my favorite Sigur Ross song. This is one of the most nostalgic single pieces of music that there that exists for me. Uh, This makes me feel like I am eight years old. I was eight years old when this came out. But also makes me feel like I'm 88 years old. It's it's kind of the, the the beginning proper to this record because like with a good beginning, you have a sort of gentle intro track that kind of like texturally eases you in, and then this begins as the first song proper. And this song fucking rules. Like this, everything about this texturally is everything I love about Sigur Ross. And already you notice a change from parentheses. It's not an improvement. It's not about a change in quality at all. It's just a change in sound. And here you have a slightly more filled out palette than what you had on the previous records. And again, that's not to denigrate either of them. It's just a different sound. You have a Mm -hmm. little bit more instrumentation happening here in general, a little bit more textural density. Uh, You have a wider presence of things like glockenspiel, and a wider expansion of their brass section as well. And and that brass section as well being brought to a much more prominence. You have my favorite bass tone that George Holm has ever laid down as well. It just begins at the start of the song and it's just like the thickest, warmest bass tone you've ever heard in your life. Yonzi's vocals sound ghostlier, but also more intimate than ever. And the textures of the glockenspiel which are really kind of consistent but also sort of abstract in the way that they're layered through the song really really compelling the percussion as well i'm not exactly sure what ori is doing on this song it's really muffled it sounds like uh some kind of like stomping uh sound but it's also kind of like got this gentleness to it it gives the whole thing a sort of feel of a march that's kind of happening this is also associated with an incredibly emotional music video that I also uh, would like watch on repeat as a kid and cry my eyes out to Uh, uh, something that represented, I guess, this energy of communality in youth as well. Uh, The music video being of course about a bunch of young people who must've been my age when this was filmed, just kind of traversing through the landscapes of Iceland and eventually taking flight off of a cliff and just flying over the water and the whole thing makes you feel that way it makes you feel warm it makes you feel comforted in a cold landscape it makes you feel like you are surrounded by people who feel the same way that you do and then in its gorgeous build to its genuinely metallic conclusion it feels like the anything is possible it feels like 
you are taking flight. It feels like you are bursting into flames and emerging from that fire as something that cannot be touched. And it still, to this day, gets me. And I've heard it probably at least 500 times, um, especially considering that in the early days, when I had my first MP3 player, and I only had like 50 songs on it, and this was the first one. Uh, and you know how I know it was the first one that showed up when I brought open data up and turned on the songs is because I deliberately put a zero in the front of the title because I had ripped it from YouTube. Uh, it probably sounded like shit. Um, huh. No, I would have ripped it from the CD, but I ripped a whole bunch of Sigur Ross songs from um, YouTube that weren't on CDs that my dad had. Um, but I deliberately put a zero in front of the title so that it would, because they all just went in alphabetical order on this thing. But I mm -hmm. wanted this to be the first song. So I did that and I remember <laughs> that distinctly. And yeah, and it's 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 one song among many on this record that are associated and embedded so firmly in my childhood to me. To me, this is the most consistently comforting and exciting and life-affirming Siguros records. And of course, as well, just to take it away from me a little bit for a minute here, probably, I don't know if it's the still the most commercially successful and well-selling one, but it is definitely up there. This album was the moment I think where Siguros really crossed over. And a big part of that was the success of songs like Glossoli and Say Gloper, my second favorite song on here, which just, which just builds and builds and just explodes and is the most amazing sounding thing ever, like half of this fucking record is. Those songs were huge. They had music videos that I remember distinctly. But the biggest song on this record, uh, probably the, still the biggest Sigur Rós song, the one that any individual random human being is most likely to have heard, is Hoppy Pola, or Hopping into Puddles. This the, the piano melody from this is iconic and has been in like so many different mm -hmm. like commercials and trailers and all sorts of things that it kind of, you know, that saturation of it threatens to take away some of its power. But I still feel like when you put this record on and you hear it, like, I mean, it's it's so impossible for me not to well up a little bit. It's it's incredibly ostentatious and it represents like, especially when the strings sort of swell and then towards the end of this, it's like so melodramatic and over the top in a way that Sigur Ross were leaning into with their late 2000s albums. But I don't know, it still feels like one of that era's like most essential and, and beautiful songs. I could go on and on about this record, but I'm going to stop there and I'll come back to uh, favorites and stuff. I'm curious again, so presuming you're going through Sigur Ross in order at this point, uh, what was this the experience of this one like for you, Jake? Uh, what stood out about it to you, especially coming off of the back of a record as austere and sort of cold as the, the parentheses album? It's interesting. I originally listened to this and while I immediately gravitated towards the fact that this feels like like Glowing Soul, for instance. I mean, you talked about that wonderfully. That's my favorite song on the album, too. It's a perfect song. I it's it's just but but it also feels like the most traditionally structured Sigur Rós song up until this point, which I think once you sort of illuminated me into the fact that this is like the most commercial, like at least one of the most commercially successful Sigur Rós albums, that makes a lot of sense to me. It's because it isn't really hindered by the potentially alienating slower pace of uh, the of a good beginning or brackets. So, you know, if you're just looking for a commercially viable, accessible version of their sound, this is absolutely it if you're looking to get into this band this is probably where i would recommend you start because it's going with like it's playing with ideas that feel a little bit more conventional it's just filtered through their sound and originally when i listened to it i kind of had the same problem with it that i did a good beginning where a lot of it did kind of feel a bit emotionally monotone but the more I listened to it, the more I kind of discovered that this album's secrets are in its very tiny instrumental details and that this became probably the biggest grower in their discography for me. Just front to back, it's full of such energy and vitality and it feels like it really just purely evokes youth just by its sound it, this song there these songs just feel inherently linked to a sense of nostalgia and and childhood that it it, it starts to feel like 
almost that Sigurus are sort of becoming a dream pop indie rock band. Like this is when the band's uh, connections to uh, other sort of acts like, you know, quintessentially 2000s acts like Animal Collective, I think it becomes a little bit more tangible and also sort of explains how they were able to sort of maintain success the way that they were. But I just, I think that this sort of heralds a sort of new vision of the band to come that I do like in other various incarnations more down the road, but here still feels like it doesn't have any sort of growing pains of them transitioning into this more accessible sound, which is kind of like mind boggling. You have shit like the, uh, I'm, you alluded to uh, the, the sort of other song on this album that's really like popular and beloved, which translates to Lost at Sea. The, the piano melody at the very beginning of this is burned into my brain from the moment I first heard it. It's so simple. It's so gorgeous. And this just like, if you thought that the sort of like crescendos and explosions of drums on the previous two albums, as sparsely as that actually like happened as an instrumental idea, was cool you're gonna dig the shit out of this album because this is when the rhythm section really becomes like not to like underplay its usage before but here it becomes the vitality of the band and like the the drums on here they sound enormous and they invoke like a real feeling of melancholy at the end of this song somehow and yeah. I, I I will say that you, you kind of have to listen to it multiple times to sort of get the kind of multifaceted emotional tone that this album does actually contain. I think there's also like uh, the penultimate song, uh, So Quietly, is like it has like the thickest atmosphere of anything on here. It feels like you just get lost in it. It has like this really odd timbre that feels like foggy and surreal until the proper song just kind of locks into place in its second half and like the, the second half of this album just kind of hits this stride where it almost feels like a continuous stretch of music that's ever evolving but they do still feel distinct within their own specific structures it just it feels like the point where they have discovered a new facet to just drive their sound from this point onward and it's so so ruthlessly compelling and and fun to listen to like this is a just a, a joyous record i just put this on and for as multifaceted as it might be i i just have an absolute blast with it if, like it, it feels like an album that contains the the pure essence of of childlike wonder and i i really value that about this band mm. i think i feel like i've already told enough stories about like experiencing this record and and well specifically glossary but really the whole thing that it's really kind of embedded itself and stuck into my mind like for most people hoppy polar is you know a happy commercial song or they think of the music video which is literally a bunch of old people causing mayhem uh in an icelandic city um but i think of like for me, that song is inextricably attached to Med Blod Nasir, uh, the song that follows it, which is kind of like an extended outro that, again, is like, it has this unnecessarily fucking awesome drum solo <laughs> that's being played oh, throughout Oh, God, it. yes. It's so fucking sick. Um, there are moments that don't connect with me as much, like Seed List and uh, the closing track are a little bit more paired back, but I don't, I never want to skip either of them. Uh, and I do think that the no, back half no. of this record has its delights as well. Uh, I want to shout out uh, my favorite, probably my favorite deep cut on any Siggy Ross album, a top five song of theirs for me, Gong, the eighth track here. Uh, Ooh, yeah. This to me is like, I I don't know why this song isn't massive. <laughs> like this song is so in your face. It's so punchy. It has such so much of the... Uh, attributes of their most accessible work that kind of makes it really really easy to just play on a loop or get stuck in your head a amazing piano melodies again absolutely vicious drumming but it's like it's not overwhelmed well, it is overwhelming but it's not like so intense that it overthrows the song it's just like really really persistent yeah. and complex and it just gives it this real quality to it this heft and this forward movement that is such a big part of so much of the music that I love the most from them. Um, but you also get uh, in their songs, they're a little bit more 
uh, sprawling songs like Milano and Andvari, uh, the song that follows Gong, which kind of like is subtly one of the most beautiful songs here, actually, this ninth track, because it, it just is a real showcase for how beautifully this band can use strings as well to accentuate uh, and kind of almost harmonize with or a compliment or play off of what Yonzi is doing vocally. And I love the decision to just like let the last two minutes of the song just be an extended uh, moment to sit with the strings and nothing else. It's so mm -hmm. beautiful and it's such a an unusual decision that kind of really catches you off guard. It's a record that I think for all of its immediacy, it does allow itself to meander in certain parts. And I don't say that in a negative way. Um, because I think with Siggy Ross, yeah. meandering is kind of, it's part of the deal, especially when the music is as beautiful as it mm -hmm. is. Uh, sometimes I do think the songs meander a little bit too much, as with Celeste and Milano, but they are worth it for the satisfaction of where those songs go and what they give you. Uh, and I think that even though the record feels like it almost has three consistent songs in a row at the end that kind of sound like the end of the album, it almost like, okay, this must mm -hmm. be the last song. Oh, okay, there's another one. That's cool. Uh, it doesn't really detract hmm. all that much from my enjoyment of the album or my ability to listen to it in full. It, it just no. makes it all the more uh, like a, an embarrassment of riches, I suppose I would call it. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, at the end of the day, I come back to Glossoli, I come back to Say Gloper, I come back to Gong, I come back to Anvari, I come back to Hopi Pola and Medmore Blodness here all the time. And in most of the times that I feel like coming back to those songs, I'm inevitably listening to this whole record. It is, I know this is probably for a lot of people out there, especially people who are around our age, it's probably the record that um, you might connect with the most. Whereas if you're like, say, five or 10 years older than us, you probably connect a bit more with the earlier stuff. But this is mm -hmm. the, you know, this is the album for people who were, I think, between like five and 15, I suppose, when it came out. Uh, this is the album that I think is Sigur Ross the most, if that can make any sort, sort of sense. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it is such a smart and like savvy decision as well to kind of really build on their hype. And it feels in a lot of ways like what you would expect this band to do. And you're almost surprised they haven't done it sooner. And it's really interesting because you can see how it does. And again, subtle ways borrow from certain cultural tropes of bands like Radiohead and you can also see how it would go on to influence bands like Coldplay as well I was thinking about that this week about how much this album clearly influenced like Viva La Vida era Coldplay um, and their decision to kind of pivot into that sort of more grandiose direction uh, I do think this is one of the most influential albums of the 2000s and one that will probably mean a lot to me mean the most to me uh, forever which brings us to a stopgap release that we need to talk about before we move on to the next album proper. Uh, the 2007 mm -hmm. double EP, uh, Varfheim. Uh, technically, it's two EPs that are kind of packaged together in one release. Uh, one is an EP of original material, well, mostly original material, three original songs, and then two re-recordings of songs from their first album, one of which featured on the single release for Hobby Pola, and then there's another EP package along here of live versions of songs from previous records as well. Uh, this is, of course, Havarf Heim, which was released in conjunction with the DVD documentary slash concert recording uh, film Heimer, which I remember very distinctly watching when around the time that it came out. I'm pretty sure my dad either rented or bought that DVD. Um, but this was kind of released as... A sort of an accompaniment i kind of think of it in the same way that i think of i think of this in association with tuck in the same way that i think of like still in association with the fragile uh by nine inch nails it's kind yeah, of like yeah. this sort of uh complimentary thing that kind of gives you a little bit more although i guess maybe the sound of it is a little bit closer to the brackets album than tuck but nevertheless Mm -hmm. a, a record a release that i've kind of underrated i haven't actually listened to this as much as i maybe should have but i've spent a lot of time listening to it in the last few weeks uh particularly for varf i mean the live versions on heim are great and they have this mm -hmm. more intimate sort of stripped back quality to them that makes them quite nice and unique but i really am here for the varf ep the five songs on side one which incidentally is 
depending on how you translate it, that word can either mean disappeared or haven, which I think is interesting. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Jake, what do you think of this, of the original songs on the Havarf side of this split EP? And how do you think that they fit into or complement the albums that we've already been talking about? I think it's kind of fascinating how well this congeals into what feels like a, a substantial release from the band. I mean, if you discount the fact that the the live cuts do have a distinctly different aesthetic kind of, it still feels like it's all in keeping. It almost feels like a sort of, I mean, like great compilations of uh compilation tracks from other bands it sort of feels like a highlight reel in some respects and it also has those aforementioned uh redos of songs like Vaughn which I think is found in its definitive incarnation on its uh first incorporation on here which is on the Varf half uh which is oh god it's fucking gorgeous uh I I am also fond of the version of it that concludes the uh heim half as well uh that there are two distinct versions of it on here both great and i think this gets a lot of mileage out of just being a solid release that has no real identifiable weak points for me i just think mm -hmm. every song here is really really solid stuff that elaborates on ideas that aren't new for the band but still feel like they're giving you everything that you love about Sigur Ross. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll say that maybe my favorite cut on here is the second track. Uh, yeah. Not even going to begin to try and pronounce Hjol, that one. Hjol, Hjolmeland, uh, which, was, which was formerly known as Rock Lager, the what? rock song. It's a fucking, it's a stunning piece of music. It's a little bit shorter than most of the stuff on here, but I find that its brevity kind of suits it really well. And I, I think that it's kind of like awesome that the the live recordings are as high quality as they are, because while they are more stripped back, it's difficult to tell that they are in fact live recordings just because this band's full sound just sort of suits a live sound really well so you know only people with keen ears will even be able to tell that that's the case there's no like shift that you have to make like i can't necessarily like listen to this as like uh one distinct half over the other because i've listened to this a fair bit and i i, I feel like it's a complete package uh as a whole it's not the, a you know it's not a definitive statement like the other albums are just because it is a little bit more scattershot from their career up until this point. And I think there's enough variation in each record so that, you know, it taking from multiple records is a bit like mildly disorienting once you're familiar with the other versions of these songs. But like just as a standalone release, if you're just looking for 70 minutes of great music from this band, absolutely give this a shot i mean this is not a technical canon release from the band but in my view it is a 110 percent essential one like if you like this band you need need to hear this i mm -hmm. am all about the version of half soul on this the fifth song here very, I mean, just one good. of my favorite Siggy Ross songs in general i love that the tone of it the warmth of it the way that it builds as well I just, I, 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 I've really, this is really warm to me, this EP, uh, the more that I've listened to it. And the rock song, the second track here, particularly as well, this was actually released as a single. And I think it is one of the band's like best examples of, again, how good they are at crafting like quite conventionally structured and friendly music that you could see potentially in a warped alternate dimension, quite making it onto the, you know, mainstream radio almost. It's very accessible. It's a very good and uh, catchy song. And on that note, speaking of accessibility and catchiness, we move now into the band's fifth studio album released in June of 2008, Med Sud i Erum Vid Spilum Endelost, or in English, with a buzz in our ears, we play endlessly, which is kind of like the logical extreme almost in some ways of the direction that they heralded with tuck which is to say moving away from abstract long-winded post-rock with massive sort of swells and stuff and moving more towards a landscape of pop music that as we've kind of highlighted 
their inherent strengths and some of the stuff that they're best at doing kind of hints at a skill in this arena that they kind of fully embrace here. Well, mostly embrace, because this is definitely a scattershot record where you kind of have a bit of a, a, a flavor of everything to a certain extent, because yes, there are those pop songs on there. There's acoustic ballads on here as well that very much feel quite typical of the kind of late 2000s coffee shop uh, pop albums that would were a dime a dozen. I don't even say that negatively. It's just kind of, I feel like what they're trying to capture. And there's also a couple of proper you know, eight, nine minute epics thrown in here for good measure as well. It's kind of an album that veers all over the shop, to be honest. And as a result of that, I think it is one of the most kinetic and just frequently immediate, uh, hard hitting Sigur Rós albums. But it's also a record that I think has kind of been overlooked a little bit as a whole, like some of its individual songs stand out, but I don't often see people talking about this as an album very much. It's kind of a bit overlooked. Um, I think that some of its shortcomings in terms of its wild structure do contribute to that to a certain extent, but I will get into that a bit later on. Uh, it is a very, very good album, though. It's a very entertaining album. It demonstrates a new sound for Sigur Ross, above and beyond just pivoting into that pop music stuff. But as the reviews at the time were want to point out, this was a year after Animal Collective dropped Strawberry Jam, and you do get a lot of you know, Sun Tong's Strawberry Jam-esque Animal Collective vibes coming through on some of the early tracks here, particularly lead single and opening track Gobbledygook, which is a just joyful piece of bizarre weirdo pop music that is absolutely addictive and catchy as hell. Jake, I want to let you go into this record because I know that you love this album. How do you characterize or talk about what the appeal of this record is and what the experience of listening it, to it is like and what was what it was like for you as well when you got to it in this stage of their discog? To me, this is the band sort of taking their sound in that logical progression that you hinted at, but also structuring their album in such a way that it capitalizes on the actual album structure and what they can do with the tones of their songs to accomplish in terms of like an actual front to back A to B journey. And as such, this is one of the most eclectic and exciting albums that they have made. And I won't lie, I can see why this seems to be sort of the first Sigur Rós album that's sort of a bit of a drop off for people in terms of critical reception. I, I kind of get it. But at the same time, everything about this album works for me. I I adore this thing from front to back. I mean, you already hinted at the opening track, Gobbledygook, which, I mean, amusing title uh, aside, I love the very silly la 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 beginning that they had to have those like weird little vocal harmonies. And then the drums, the fucking drums at the very beginning of this song, they're like huge and tribal. It's it's unlike anything they've made up until this point because it feels very like the the instrumental qualities that this out that this band usually dabble in very much commingle with one another whereas i feel like a lot of the stuff on here is very isolated and very distinct and allows you to sort of appreciate the individual identities of the musicians contributing to this particular sound also helps that on uh production and we have flood uh, as a matter of fact, who is on the engineering side of things, who we have mentioned in stuff like uh, Depeche Mode when yeah. we covered their album Songs of Faith and Devotion. Uh, Flood also went on to work with uh, bands like the Smashing Pumpkins. Nine Inch Nails. And, uh, yeah, and Nine Inch Nails. And I feel like that sound here is fully capitalized and when they are leaning into their most traditional Sigurov's esque sounds. But I do love when this band kind of deviates from that and give this album an individual identity. Like the second song sort of continues that uh, the chimes and repeated builds in this song are childlike and exuberant. The horn swell at the end is just, it's one of the band's finest moments for me. Uh, I love the song after that as well. It just sort of gently begins and eventually moves into this chilly, ethereal place that the song just kind of gestates in. It doesn't really progress from there, but it just sort of lets you melt into it. And then you have uh, a sort of stretch on here that I just think is undeniably 
phenomenal. You have the fourth track on here, which is the We Play Endlessly, which is more traditionally structured, but very ornate, very pretty, that builds into the next track very flawlessly. And this sort of three-track run here of Festival, Medsud, and Arabatur, this is the moment for me where this <laughs> album fucking hits. Uh, Festival is, it starts as one of the slowest, most lethargic songs this band have ever made. And then gradually introduces idea after idea instrumentally until a steady drum beat becomes lightning fast in its final moments where this bright instrumental explosion just radiates with that kind of unbridled youth and leaves me absolutely fucking stunned. And then you sort of have what I would deem the interstitial moment of this sort of middle stretch here, which is Med Sud. I love and this, this song, song so much. So underrated. Just gorgeous. Yes. It's got this beautiful, steady piano melody that just carries you through the start. And the piano arpeggiations in the center are just fucking wonderful. And it has like a false climax at the end. But then it serves to sort of segue into uh, what I think is my favorite song on here, which is uh, Arabatur, which is translates to rowboat. And something about the plainness of Yonzi's vocals at the start here, they're really unadorned. They really get me in combination with the piano. This reminds me a lot of this is a, another Jake Core filmic reference here is that this song specifically and this album in general um if you are familiar with the films of makoto shinkai you know the japanese uh sort of pop punk band radwimps um this is literally just sounds like one of their songs like jonesy even sounds like the lead vocalist of that band it's genuinely quite uncanny and that's very much the appeal of this album to me is that it feels like a makoto shinkai film where it's just unbridled bright youth and fun and beauty and romance and and this song here it, it the final two minutes with the sort of lush orchestration and the choir makes me feel like i am floating into the sky and then disintegrating like the, the rest of the record could be like dog shit and if it was built around this final two minutes i i would love it i don't care and after that you do have a stretch of songs here that are a lot more low-key and plaintive and generally kind of dour when it comes to their tone uh and at first this is what held me back from thinking this was one of the band's best albums but now this stretch of songs is also why I consider this to be one of the band's best albums is that it showcases a versatility of like the first third being a very childish, very fun sort of segment. And it feels like the midsection is sort of a transitional metamorphosis into sort of maturation into adulthood. And it dwells on this sort of melancholic loss of innocence, sonically speaking, with stuff like oh, Weeds, wow. which is a really lovely folkish ballad that becomes rather inert at the end. But I feel it's kind of necessary in the come down from the very exciting first half of the album. It just sort of begins this more mature art here. And then there's the more traditional um, Vic, I, I don't Close even know. Uh, uh, it, it's more traditional feeling, but it still holds on to a sort of like reminiscence that the first half has that's mm. stilted in its progression, but nonetheless absolutely beautiful. And then there's a uh, strongness, uh, which is brief, but it's this minimal haunting ambience that I really appreciate and lets you dwell on the inevitable darkness of the future and of faded youth and then it goes beautifully into all all right which is the record feeling as though it's sort of making peace with itself it's like a slow steady exhale that feels minimal and melancholic but completes a really satisfying arc and it leads to this complete experience of this journey of this album to me which is their shortest album thus far even though it is 55 minutes long 
but still feels like one of their most complete journeys as like a narrative arc. And it leads me to coming back to this over and over again, just because of the raw versatility at play here. I, I think this is a, a deeply, deeply underappreciated record. You know what, Jake? I think you might have even like turned me on this a little bit more just by talk by what you've just said, because I've never thought about it structurally like that. And in terms of thirds, where you do start with the very ineffable and like incredibly over the top kind of exuberance of youth. And again, it can't be impressed enough how much that first song sounds like uh, Sung Tong's era and mm-hmm. collective, especially, which I don't use to kind of as a reductive comparison. I know it's overdone, but I, I say that in the most complimentary way possible. And also the I second too. the second track, which is actually my favorite song on this album, uh, just the best pop song I think they've ever so done. Good. Uh, a so gloriously good. gorgeous thing like this the, the second half of this second track when it just kind of becomes this chanting refrain legitimately Mm -hmm. like (laughs) within me a lunatic sings is a great uh title for it which is the english translation because that's exactly how i feel um i mean mean, well that sounds like av tear lyrics like the animal collective comparison here i feel like is equally as strong yeah and then you have um uh gordon duggan which i actually think is the most underrated song here i love yes. the tone and the warmth yes. of this track so much it's gorgeous again it's that same sort of like gentle acoustic based song as the title track on a Gator's version it has the same sort of feeling to it um and it's i love that it is allowed to stretch out for five minutes i never get bored of it um and then the run through um Vishpilam in the last festival, Midsud Iram, and Arabatura is just like it's par excellence. I've kind of uh come around a little bit on Arabatura. I used to kind of feel like it was a little bit too ostentatious for even my tastes, but I don't know. I think as I've gotten a little bit older, I've started I've started to just kind of uh embrace that ostentatiousness. It certainly fits a band like this, especially having like a you have a 90 piece orchestra slash choir on this song. 90 people are playing on this song at the conclusion of it. Ooh. It's so much that I almost feel like uh, the mix can barely handle it all as, as hard as Flood tries, but it is a beautiful song. And Yonzi's vocal melodies, particularly early on, are astounding. Um, Mitsuri Iram, the sixth track, is, as I said, I think another underrated song. I, I love one of my favorite sonic tricks that uh, I guess we have to credit Flood for, but also the band as well, because they co-produced, is that this song has two drum lines, one of which is being played forward, and the other which is being played in reverse and kind of like lowered oh, under wow. the mix. So you have these two simultaneous drum sounds that are happening, and they are like completely at odds with each other, and they just create this swirling, disorienting feel and that's it's just being anchored by that piano line and Yonzi's melody uh, vocal melody and then that last minute of the song where that kind of all just fades away and you just get that last burst of rhythm is so uh, it's one of the most singular moments in this whole discography I really love it I'm not as hot on the last four songs still but I think that what you said about approaching the record in three thirds of youth of maturation and then of kind of like a a coming to terms with aging sort of thing or uh, coming to terms with this older state that you now exist in that actually now that you've said that it, it fits like a glove with how this record sounds and also because i'm a person who loves meta narratives it fits beautifully mm-hmm. into the meta narrative of this band as well where you kind of are like no, there's no spoiler alert, but looking ahead here, we're going to move into some music that's much less playful and much more kind of mm-hmm. darker and more uh, tonally morose and intense in their subsequent releases. So it does feel like they're kind of like, with the first half of this record or the first third or so, really embracing that vibrance that they're going for, that youthfulness, but also kind of with the rest of this album, saying goodbye to it in a very kind mm-hmm. of potent way. And that is quite affecting. It's quite beautiful. And I think thinking about it in that way does make the structural strangeness of it make a little bit more sense in retrospect. So, yeah. And and of course, it's notable for the closing track being the first and I think to date only song that the band have released anyway, uh, sung in English as well. So Mm -hmm. I'm not 
even terribly sure of the significance of that, but it does feel like in some ways that represents a kind of uh, step away. I don't want to say a step forward or a maturation because that would be kind of a bit condescending towards the Icelandic mm-hmm. language, but it represents some kind of change uh, or some kind of, I guess, forthrightness, some kind of stripping away of you know the ethereal artifice of the you know wordless, meaningless vocals to just directly address you know, the vast majority of the band's audience who are admittedly going to be English speakers and just to kind of be a bit more candid than maybe Yonzi has ever been before. And I don't love it as a song. I think it's good. But that aspect of it does, I think, lend uh, an additional level of poignance, I'll say. Mm -hmm. So yeah, a a really, really special album, a great album. I will say that. I will go that far. And one, I think that, yeah, I, I am going to hear slightly differently from now on thinking about what you've said, Jake. Uh, it is a really, really, really awesome. beautiful album. It deserves more love, more attention. It deserves more appreciation for the album that it is. And um, I guess now, especially like how unique and singular it is. It almost felt for a little bit of a time like Sigur Ross were risking slightly becoming a little bit of a parody of themselves. Or at least like uh, circling, w- spinning wheels in a certain sense, or heading down this pathway towards a kind of a pale imitation of what they once were in terms of the heft and heaviness that they used to have. But I feel like in the context now appreciating this as the part of the discography that it is, with a lot of distance from it, it is easier to appreciate and um, I think easier to treasure as well, because it is really the only album quite like it in this discography. Mm-hmm. so on that note we take another little bit of a detour before we get to the next album proper uh there's a couple of interstitial releases i want to talk about uh first of all i don't know whether or not you had a chance to listen to this jake but don't fret if you didn't i just want to shout it out in the interim uh, in 2009 yonzi put out a solo record with his partner alex summers called rice boy sleeps uh, it is in a straightforward ambient drone album. Through and through, it is over an hour of just straight ambience. And if you approach it with that framework, I think it is an absolutely gorgeous experience. A lot of people, I think, have I, this record has some really negative, got some really negative reviews and really kind of like harsh responses, I guess, for being like plodding and boring and samey and stuff. And look, I get it, but it's an ambient album like it is <laughs> it's an ambient record it's not a record with you know songs on it in any conventional sense but the textures are gorgeous especially tracks like happiness indian summer boy 1904 uh, a really really special release and if hearing a little bit more of the ambient side appeals to you as a concept i have to recommend this wholeheartedly yeah, I want to get to this uh, a lot just because I feel like sometimes when this band leans into their more ambient leanings, they are at their most compelling. So this is mm. certainly high on my priority list. Yeah, I mean, it is, to be clear, a solo record with, with John Z mm. in, in collaboration with his partner, Alex, but uh, still has a lot of the same aesthetic qualities of Sigur Ross, just very, very much peered down into this minimalist landscape. But something that doesn't have a minimalist landscape and something that works uh, as a complement to mid sud Eram beautifully, I think, is Yonzi's first solo studio album proper, which is 2010's Go. Uh, this is a record that I, I remember listening to when I was, you know, in my biggest Sigur Ross phase. And yeah, this is pretty, pretty cool. I never really had a huge attachment to it. Um, but courtesy of friend of the podcast, friend of ours, Connor, who I think considers this one of his favorite albums of all time. I've gone back to this record every now and then, and I felt it grow on me more and more and more. Uh, I think particularly as I've come to appreciate Midsuri Eren more and more, I think I've also come to appreciate this more and more and more. Uh, This is one of the most explosive and joyful and colorful releases that you'll find in the entire oeuvre of Sigur Ross more broadly, even though we're talking about the band and not solo material as much, I still wanted to have a mini segment on this because I think this is a great album. Uh, notably as well, though it doesn't feature any of the other members of Sigur Ross, it does feature uh, arrangements and instrumentation from the great Nico Muley, who is one of the great 
contemporary classical composers and contributors to a lot of more adventurous indie rock music has been involved with a number of artists that you and I love, like Sufjan Stevens, for instance. And he is here helping out with the uh, arrangements, the string arrangements and some of the compositions as well. And this is a completely addictively kinetic and joyful record. It is absolutely infectious. There's more English singing on this record as well, more leaning mm -hmm. into that kind of playful, joyful sort of uh, ridiculous fun of some of that early stuff on Medsud. But of course, it being a solo record, it feels distinct from that band narrative that we've been building on. Um, but yeah, Jake, what did you think of this record when you gave it a listen earlier? I can really only co-sign all of the good things about this. It sort of feels like we are about to take a bit of a tonal turn into uh, something quite different in the discography. And it almost feels like Yonzi was like, he just had more creative fun energy and just needed to get it out of his system and then as a result this record was formed and thus if you found yourself at a bit of a distance with med sud i mean like uh riley kind of was about like if you haven't quite embraced the whole narrative of that or if you just like the a little bit more kinetic first half more you're going to like this album it is a bit more maximal and just like it is more bright and more colorful and more dreamy and chamber poppy and thus is a bit more immediately satisfying to listen to and as a result i feel like it sort of earns its own identity within the Sigur Ross canon of even though it is sort of its own individual thing it's it, it sort of needs to exist because otherwise i feel like there would be a distinct niche of this discography that went unfilled of sort of just like, I, I wish, you know, for as much as I love Medsud and do even prefer it to this album, I still would in theory want an album like this to exist purely to see how they would pull it off. And mm. they do. Uh, yeah. It's consistent from front to back, really, though. I do think the album doesn't get much better than the uh, one two punch of Go Do and Animal Arithmetic. Uh, those two songs are fucking amazing, though. I do think it is bookended well with also Grow Till Tall, which wow. is just one of the best vocal hooks just goddamn ever. And it's just so sublime <laughs> and I, I think the the um, ending track, too, is just as stellar as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, I, I think that this is a fun, it's a little bit tighter of a record, too. It's only 40 minutes. So if you want that, but concentrate it into a more sort of potent uh, instrumental form, I think you'll also have fun here. If we're going along with the sort of animal collective analogy, I think this is easily seen as the person pitch uh, of this particular <laughs> discography, of it being like, it's a side project, but it is no less essential than anything here. Uh, and, and deeply underrated in general, too. This is something that just deserves so much more love than it's gotten. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um... I like the person pitch comp as well. No, this is a fun, fantastic album from front to back. Uh, I'll second, like the three songs you've shouted out specifically by name are my three favorites as well. I do love Boy Lily Koi as well, Sinking Friendships mm. and the closing track, brilliant, brilliant stuff. Uh, there's really not anything that is discernibly weak on this record. It's a very tight nine tracks, 40 minutes. It's a really great punch of fantastic music that never lets you down. The climax of Grow Till Tall, the way that song just kind of like just builds and builds and builds and builds until it can <laughs> barely fucking hold itself together. Um, shout out, by the way, producer Man. on this record, Peter Cadis, the indie legend the behind boy. the boards, alongside uh, Yonzi and Alex, also with production credits too. Stunning, 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 stunning. And do not overlook this when you're getting into Sigur Ross. Mm -hmm. That goes particularly to all my all of our friends out there who might be planning on getting into Sigur Ross and watching this video. Uh, don't miss this album. It's also worth noting as well uh, that Yonzi the very next year would go on to do the score for the Cameron Crowe film, We Bought a Zoo. Uh, just a fun little wrinkle in the narrative of his career. Uh, and I guess maybe so somewhat repaying the favor for Vanilla Sky. But in 2012, we finally get, after a four-year wait, the longest wait between Sigur Rós albums, we get the album Voltari, 
the sixth stu studio album from Seguros. Now I can already tell this segment is going to be a long one. I know, Jake, you have a lot to say. So I won't get very much into the content of the album, but I will talk a lot about the context of it. Because this was the first Sigur Ross album that I was cognizantly following and experiencing the rollout for. And this album had quite the rollout. A much more extra and multimedia rollout than you might suspect for the sound of this record. Which is, to be clear, much more stripped back and modest than the bombastic sounds of their previous two records. Uh, this is the definition of the understated follow-up to the ostentatious, you know, pop masterpiece, I suppose. Uh, it is a record that was, you know, it's, of course, destined to be overlooked uh, to some extent because of its modest approach from a band that are known and beloved for intensity and loudness. There's really only one moment on this record that does what you would expect from a Siggy Ross song, conventionally speaking. But... Nevertheless, uh, this was an album that I was transfixed on for the entirety of its rollout. It came out in May of 2012, shortly after my 15th birthday. I remember specifically buying this. Uh, it was one of the very few CDs that I was at the time able to buy with my own money. Uh, I bought this very, like, basically, I'm pretty sure it was the day it came out. I still have the CD, actually. I'll go and get it in a minute while you're talking, but... um. This album was my obsession for months. Like 2012, this was there was not a single album in 2012 I listened to more than this. This was my favorite Sigur Ross album for a long time. Uh, it still is an album that I have an incredibly strong attachment to. A lot of it was time and place, you know, being there, experiencing that rollout as well. Just being at a particularly emo stage of my life as well. I think you can imagine 15 year old me I was you know in a getting into relationships and I was going through all this kind of like incredibly intense pubescent shit that was happening at that time and so I was looking for music to kind of just feel feels to <laughs> more or less uh and this was just like one of those things I fixated on but in terms of its rollout what's really interesting about the rollout for this record obviously influenced by Yonzi's work on projects like uh, Rice Boy Sleeps as well, exploring that more ambient textural side of his musical skills and, and taking that to the full band as well. Uh, also worth noting too that uh, something we've slightly glanced over, which is the band released their first proper live album in 2011, Any Great Album, by the way. Yeah. Also a record that ends with a song that at the time, I can't remember, it had a different title, uh, completely instrumental song that uh, ended up being repurposed and features on this record in essentially the same form as the, I think it's the sixth track, Vardeldur. But anyway, we were getting teasers and hints that the next Sigur Ross album would be a step backwards, a more uh, reflective tone. Uh, that was described by George Holm as having more of an electronic tinge than a dance tinge. And he described it beautifully in a way that has always stuck with me as an avalanche in slow motion, which is like emotionally a lot of what this does feel like. Uh, yes, people think of it and they think of its sparseness, but actually texturally, it's a dense album with a lot happening in a lot of its moments and a few moments that are more sparse to give you that breathing room. But anyway... What I want to talk about in terms of the release of this album, the most, the thing that most I, I most fondly remember is something called the Valtari Mystery Film Experiment, where what Siguros did is they gave a dozen filmmakers a certain budget. I can't remember how much it was. And they said, we want you to make a music video for any song on this record that you want. And we want you to make that music video based on whatever comes into your head when you listen to the song, whatever the song makes you feel, whatever the song makes you picture. Uh, they, I think, also had this competition where, where amateur filmmakers could um, submit their own videos and um, they would pick the one they liked the most as the kind of like winner, in addition to the ones that were specifically commissioned from filmmakers such as Alma Harrell, John Cameron Mitchell, Ryan McGinley, Raman Bahrani, uh, and so you had, 
in my memory there were definitely more than a dozen i remember heaps of videos uh, many songs had multiple different videos and they're all very distinct and all very affecting and all very emotional and some were better than others some were a little bit more pretentious some were just heartbreaking uh they were all over the shop and i remember this visual accompaniment i, I just because i listened to these songs so much and i am and i am imbued and imbibed this record so much that it was such a fixture of my life for so long it was just on the precipice of me like fully diving into so much music that I would you know be always listening to something different so I would my fixations wouldn't really last super long after this but this was a months-long fixation I was obsessed with this album and I love how extra and vibrant and visual the rollout was for it because it really encouraged you and if I were to sum it up Sigur Ross really encourage you to project onto this music. I think more than anything they've ever done before. Even the Untitled record with its famously gibberish lyrics, which definitely invites some level of projection, but this even more so because it has such varied texture and emotional tone. When you listen to this, when I listen to this, stories play in my head, images play in my head, colors, it's a very synesthetic album for me. It is incredibly emotional, incredibly powerful for how much it holds back from what you would expect Siggy Ross typically to do, from how much it lets you immerse yourself in these beautiful, rich textures. Again, each member of the band feeling distinct and integral to each of these compositions. Jake, what does this album mean to you? uh how, we at what point in your run through this Siggy Ross deep dive did you discover it and what was that experience like and what are your overall feelings on it now well if you watch the podcast proper uh you will be very unsurprised to learn what I am about to expel the best and most concise way however I can put my feelings towards this record Ooh. the boy the boy yeah so this was the second Sigur Ross album I listened to after uh, I listened to their final record first purely by chance uh, and in a lot of ways it's really interesting just how strange of a pivot it was uh, to go from Kviker to this immediately afterwards because I had no context for Sigur Rós or what they were. And these two albums are just at the polar extremes of what their sound even is. I, I, I didn't know what that direction was going to be like. I didn't have any like preordained knowledge or thoughts or whatever. I went into it totally blind, which is probably in many respects, the best way to go into it. And like Riley alluded to, this is something that it really does sort of harken back to an earlier stage of this band, uh, a little bit more like Brackets, I think. But it's one of my favorite kind of albums that a band release, where they sort of take what originally was so alluring about them and capitalize on that principle while adding to it all of the interesting things and the ways that they've grown since and their other dis and their other sort of digressions in their discography. This is an album that could only be made towards the end of Sigurós' career just because of how much is here and how interesting it all is. And how, I mean, it is very experiential and synesthetic in that respect, like Riley said. It's sort of like, th this is some of my favorite kind of music to listen to where you sort of project yourself into it and it becomes a very personal experience. But it's also very likely to, you know, miss the mark with some people just because something about the sound of a given record might not gel with you on that level. And it, and it becomes very deeply personal in ways you can't really properly quantify. And in that respect, I guess that's why this is seen as Sigurós's worst or just like least loved album is that it feels like you know initially it does what other records in this discography do um and it is also very 
I won't say formless, but it does kind of feel that way. Uh, and I understand that. That said, this album is the reason that I listen to music. This is like when I watched all that jazz in film class a couple years ago when I was in college and I left and I was like, that's why I watch movies. The second I got done hearing this album, I was like, that's why I listen to music. And it's easy to see why, considering it begins with the one-two punch of uh, the opening track, Egg Anda, uh, which translates to I Breathe. Uh, the distant vocals at the very beginning of this song convey the idea of sound within a vast space because you hear vocals and they're sort of echoing and reverberating like they would in a really like large empty building and so it sort of hints at the kind of like geometric exploratory nature of the record you're already imagining in your head where this sound is or what kind of environment this sound is going to be taking place within and the string swells just create this really warm feeling, but it contrasts with the vocals. It makes the slow pace feel almost like hesitant at first. It doesn't even really feel like Sigur Ross. It really does feel ambient uh, until that sort of final third where it feels as though you've unearthed something magical and long undiscovered. It reminds me of both the feeling that I get and the actual sound of the compositions and work of Joe Hisaishi, who, if you know who he is, he is the composer for the scores of basically every Studio Ghibli movie, uh, most notably in comparisons, I would say, to Princess Mononoke and my favorite Studio Ghibli film, uh, other than Kiki's Delivery Service, uh, Castle in the Sky, which I think that sort of raw distillation of adventure and wonder is very well replicated here um or even uh the composer kevin pankin's work uh made for the series made in an abyss which is also very uh ghibli evocative and is very focused around the idea of the natural and industrial world and exploring the beauty and horror of it and it, it makes it feel really really well realized and really really stark but it also is very impressionistic it's not distinct enough for it sort of the music to overpower your interpretation of the music which is a a fine line that so few musicians and bands are able to actually ride into being successful the chilling or so final minute that this song takes is really abrupt and really disarming the first time you hear it. it it hints at this slow brooding lingering darkness that feels really mortifying at the moment like there's just something at the core here that is this dangerous and scary it's sort of that tonal versatility that was uh displayed on med sued all in one track here where you have exploration wonder awe but also the sort of lingering darkness of the future there. Uh, and, and it's really primal and scary. Like you haven't heard anything this guttural and frightening since like Vaughn. And that was really like guttural and frightening because it was kind of lo-fi and strange. And then you have Not A Sound, the second song on here, uh, AKA Eki Mook. This is my favorite. Sigur Ross song. This is the best song I have heard all year. This is one of the 10 most beautiful pieces of music I have ever heard. It lingers in the strange otherworldly darkness that the last track left, uh, left off on, but it gradually leads you what leads what, or what feels like you are walking into like a pool of warm light and then you just bathe in it there's these tense strings and this really soft bed of sounds that this album has which is just like when it just comes to the raw textural nature of this album this is 
just the best collection of raw sounds that like anyone has ever assembled ever it really reminds me actually of weirdly enough the album in the attic of the universe by the antlers um we talked about this band last Mm. year uh and i went through my very very personal sort of journey with in the attic of the universe one of my favorite albums and it is very very similar of an experience to this it's very much elongated and it feels far more earthly uh, whereas in the attic of the universe feels a bit more cosmic but they both have these kind of earthy tones that hint at something almost mythical in nature And it sort of has this like steady instrumental progression that's subtle and it lets you linger in all of its really minimal but still very distinct movements until it's almost shocking rise at the halfway point with Yonzi's vocals. And the second half that feels like you're being carried away from that light that you were drawn towards and and it's like you're just drifting further and further from it and you're just yearning to go back to it and it is it is immense. And it is the best piece of music this band have ever made. And from there, that's the thing, is that the journey this album takes you on, it just doesn't let up for me. Every single one of these songs feels like its own world. It it feels like the way you described uh, Tangerine Dreams album Zeit, in that it feels like it is building an environment more than it is building a song. And that sounds like kind of weird and pretentious, but you listen to this and that synesthetic quality really is at the forefront here. You imagine yourself within them. That's sort of those narratives that Riley said, you know, you project from this music. It's so like, it, it's, it, it just clicks in my brain instantly. And I'm just instantly transported to places that my imagination can scarcely take me unprovoked it manages to perfectly pace out these little experiences like each one of these songs really feels like it's showing you a sort of different facet of this album's identity and it like it really does kind of feel like the image evoked on this cover and we we talked about earlier how Sigurós reminds us of emo bands and I think it's interesting that with every album cover they uh, keep delivering they they look more and more like emo album covers of their era like starting with talk I think that they resemble other contemporary emo albums and this is maybe the most apt as Valtari is this really saturated green photograph with like it's got like a fingerprint in the top right it's got like these burned after images on it and it's this like just this sea and you see this little boat in the distance and it's just floating high above the sea and it is so like simple but it's also just like you feel like you're in that boat as it's rising above the sea and you're just like walking around this empty ship and experiencing this environment and what's cool about it is that it showcases the versatility of this band and that like it keeps coming back to that darkness that the band have hinted at before but have never like fully explored in my opinion but it keeps that sort of tonal balance perfectly into an experience that feels really cinematic and really like this to me feels like the most holistic Sigur Ross album because it gives you the most variety in and of itself. And it overall just ends up being a, a fucking magical experience. This is, I, I cannot get this album or these songs, like I can't get a similar experience from anything, even other Sigur Ross albums. There is simply nothing I have ever heard that sounds like Voltari. And it's nothing that's as quiet and intimate and beautiful and soft and loving or as big or as grand as this album can sometimes sound. The The title of it translates to Steamroller, which is so apt just because when this album chooses to be thick, heavy, and atmospheric, you feel like you're tr- you feel like you're atlas carrying the world on his back it, it, it's fucking enormous and i can't overstate how transportative of an experience this is anytime i put this album on wherever i am my surroundings disappear i i'm just instantly in the world of my own head 
And that's such a valuable experience to me is the the way that music can transport you. And it's inherently filled with this kind of youthful energy and, and journey that feels like it takes you back to a sort of childhood, but also doesn't like focus on the joyous parts. It sort of shows you the, you know, th that lingering darkness of adulthood that was on Med Sud. All of those elements from those other Sigur Ross albums are here, but translated in a way that is absolutely unrecognizable on here. And as a result, this ends up being not only my favorite Sigur Ross album, but easily one of my favorite albums of all time. Yeah, I mean, the experience you're describing is basically the same experience I had with it when I was 15 years old. And it still has a holds a really special place in my heart for all of those reasons. There's like a moment on this album. So for starters, Ikimuk, my uh, the second track here, my favorite on the album as well. Uh, many, many nights, an emo teenager lying in bed listening to this in the dark you know single tear etc uh feeling like the most miserable piece of shit in the world because that's what you do oh, that's what i did when i was 15 anyway listening to the just spear piano that just loops in the last 90 seconds of the song oh. just it hits every single note hits like a fucking steamroller pun intended mm -hmm. and um you know varud the third track the only track that has the conventional uh, build and release of any song on this record, even that feels like slightly different in the sense mm -hmm. that it's just kind of this continuous ascension to noise rather than like a, a, a you know, a, a slow dynamic sort of build. It just kind of like gets louder and louder and more and more intense. The, there's a level of compression. You're not even sure what's like happening on it. Yeah. There's so many moments on this album where, no matter how musically storied you are, you're just going to be like, how are, what is, what are they, what are they doing here? <laughs> Cause I don't there's, know. <laughs> there's like a level of compression in the production and particularly on the drums there that like makes it feel like this doesn't belong here and it's going to rip the whole thing apart. And I love that sense of danger that it has a song that I really love is the sort of centerpiece of this record, uh, Dao De Logan or Dead Calm. Uh, what a uh, genuinely yeah. just soulfully beautiful piece of music. It sounds like the entire planet sort of singing in harmony, but it sounds way less cheesy and corny than mm -hmm. that makes it sound. It's like this gentle sort of tonal lullaby that sounds like a, the hum of electricity and the hum of human voices. It's so peaceful and calming, you know, as the title would suggest, it is like the one of the warmest and most wholesome songs that this band have ever recorded. I, I adore it so much. It sounds like, you know, it sounds like the middle of the city in the middle of the night as much as it sounds like the forest. It is yeah. gorgeous. Uh, I also love the title track, which is the most kind of formless piece here as well. It is, there's there's like this looping sort of almost like warts glockenspiel melody that sounds like a music box that's really aged and kind of detuned and it sort of like loops and sort of it's sort of suspended in the space of the mix kind of looping while you have all this sort of ambient sound just kind of piling up around it and it's very evocative it's maybe the most purely evocative piece of music here it sounds like it sounds like you know memories fracturing in real time as you try to remember them it's it's just really something but i have to emphasize the closing track here fjorger piano or four pianos which is titled as such because the vast majority of the song is constructed from four different piano tracks that were recorded separately and are played overlapped on top of each other um, so what you're hearing is not one single piano track but multiple that are not played or composed to fit with each other or complement each other but are just kind of improvised separately and then just overlaid so it is like in a lot of ways the logical extension or end point of this record's abstract nature is this just these just lines of piano 
that are just kind of shoved together essentially and the band explore this really interesting musical idea which is how these fractured fragmented formless you know fragments of musical ideas interact with each other when they're overlaid the moments where they harmonize the moments where they're just slightly off from each other by a few seconds or by a second or fractions of a second the moments where little counter melodies happen by pure accident because different pieces of these lines of piano happen to line up it's amazing to think about and to process while you're listening to it it's it's such a beautiful artistic idea that is so richly rewarding in terms of how it progresses and how you experience it. And you get these stunning like string sounds that come in and they're kind of like, they're bowed, but they're also like, obviously they're bowed, they're string sounds, but they're like, uh, they're made to sound like so brittle and kind of high pitched and sort of like vulnerable that they just feel like, they have the sense of fractured brokenness to them that the piano has in the way that it kind of just ambles through these different tracks. And it's like the whole thing feels like something incomplete, but it never resolves to feel complete and it never falls apart entirely either. It's like listening to something that isn't fully there and just suspending yourself in that state for eight minutes of uncertainty, of in-between. And the whole record, I guess, kind of feels a little bit like that, in between, an in-between state where you haven't quite arrived at a satisfying home, but you're also neither are you embroiled in the midst of a conflict. You're just in between these states. And it gives the record attention. It gives the record a sense of suspended animation, uh, and maybe it's, it's like being in a liminal state yeah it's difficult to pin it down a lot of the time i think that's why maybe a lot of people feel a bit distanced from it because of that stated existence but it to, to me it resolves beautifully by not resolving at all with that last track mm -hmm. it just kind of ends but without ending um and i love that i love that about it, it it's so gorgeous and perfect uh, as a way of, of wrapping this whole thing up and yeah, it's an amazing album that uh, if you have heard it and don't particularly care for it, if you haven't heard it, go back and give it a shot. Go and listen to it and see if a fresh pair of it's ears makes a difference. both the least popular release of theirs and the least acclaimed. And it, I get it on one hand, but on the other hand, I just, I feel like if more people listen to this, they like there there is just a chance that you will latch onto this in the way that either of us do and it will become an invaluable experience i also mm -hmm. do want to mention there are two bonus tracks uh on this album uh there is calm and branch uh both of which very good it is somewhat difficult for me to listen to them outside of i am so in love with the experience of this as a front to back album that it's difficult for me to like listen to them because I'll listen to bonus tracks after an album is done playing. And that somewhat doesn't work here for me, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't listen to these on their own as they are, you know, great pieces of music that sound like the rest of the album. So go check those out if you're a fan. Absolutely. And on that note, we move mm -hmm. until we move to the band's most recent studio album, which came out, uh, only 13 months after Valtari. Uh, and is also, it's worth noting, I made a mistake earlier when I said that all their albums feature Kjartan Svensson. That's not true. This is the first album that doesn't feature keyboardist Kjartan Svensson. He left the band uh, before this album came out, but after Valtari was released, uh, sadly. Although that story has a good news because he recently rejoined the band just a couple of years ago and oh. will be on their, whatever their next uh, proper studio record ends up being. But Kvaker, meanwhile, exists and it just features the other three members of the band, Yonzi, George Holm, and Ori Paul Darrison. And uh, this is, I like to think of this album as kind of like a, we in a weird sense, a companion record to Voltari 
even though as you kind of forecast earlier jake it's sort of the exact opposite of it it's kind of like two mm -hmm. completely opposite sides of this band where in previous you know incarnations the two different sides of their sound that these two albums represent would kind of be fused together throughout a record like parentheses for instance uh... or whatever here they're kind of like deliberately almost separated so you have to experience with each of these two records you experience one sort of side of the band the sort of like warmer textural bliss of Valtari and the heavy metallic heft of Kvaker as these separate entities and some might hold that against these two records personally I kind of love them both even more for how distinct they are and how like aesthetically uh unique they are from each other I like the fact that the band kind of decided to do these two very very different albums uh and they have like both have minimal aesthetic album covers, but also like vastly different as well. The the you know muted warm green tones of this contrasted with the jet black terrifying image on the cover of uh, Kvaker. Uh, this album, so obviously I was following the rollout of Valtari, spent my entire year listening to that album. So I was obviously very present for the release of this as well. Uh, this was as big a surprise for me as you can imagine it was for just about any other fan of the band. By far their heaviest release. This album is hard as nails. There is a real industrial tinge to this. Specifically forecasted by opening track and lead single, Brennestein, which I, mean, I remember... fucking song. I remember when this dropped. I mean, that when this dropped and you first listened to it and that was that like, just kind of hammering, distorted bass tone. It's like fucking doom metal. You're like, what? It's fucking Is this the right sick, song? Is what it is. And like, again, you have that percussion that we, you, you know, we saw this side of Ori more so on uh, the parentheses album, but here it really comes back to the fore. That metallic clashing noise of the drums, the distortion of George's bass as well. It's so everything. All three members of this band are making up for the loss of Kiartan by essentially turning up to 11 with everything that they do and making this quite maximalist, but also very compact and tight and pretty fast paced and compacted album. Um, Jake, I think, was this the first Sigur Ross album you heard? It was. So what you want to talk about what your, I guess, experience was of throwing this on and being greeted with this and what you think of this album now uh, in light of having gone through their whole discography. I mean, even though this was my first Sigur Ross album, I was still nonetheless like gobsmacked by that opener just because you know Sigur Ross's reputation. So you have an idea of what they might sound like. And then immediately you just get this fucking like, I mean, the opening sounds like the drum hits and just the overall like tone of the very beginning sounds like fucking, I don't know, somewhat damaged by nine inch nails. And you're just like, <laughs> what? And then you have Jonesy coming in, whose vocals sound like they always have, but they're mixed in a very different way. They're very kind of distant but they're still very like present in the mix and he's you know singing like he always does and this contrast of his beautiful dreamy falsetto and just this band absolutely going bananas on this fucking album i mean holy shit the album's title translates roughly to fuse and i do feel like that sort of exclusion of one member of the band and them trying to sort of compensate for it by just kind of being loud as fuck kind of all comes together in a beautiful synergy that you would never anticipate because this is an album that feels in equal breaths kind of accessible because it has like an industrial rock sound to it but also a completely new page in terms of the chapters of this band it's it's the closest aesthetically to um a good beginning that their entire discography has come 
but it's applied in a completely different genre in a completely different context and overall it uses it like all of the advancements they've made artistically as a band and technically to make this really really tight i believe this is their actual their shortest album at like 48 minutes and it's you know it's nine songs long everything here is so well constructed and on a way you can't really first appreciate on like just one listen because each time i listened to this i just liked it more i love the industrial kind of like the polarities of this band of just it's combining the them at their dreamiest and them at their hardest so you get this sort of fusion of the two that is constantly exciting constantly invigorating constantly beautiful constantly harrowing it is a very dark feeling album i mean it's kind of evoked by that album cover of that person with this weird mask bag over their head and it just sort of feels like you're it feels like you're kind of being deprived of your senses overall this is an album that like sonically resembles like the dronier, heavier, scarier parts of brand new science fiction, but if Yonzi was singing the parts of the vocals. Uh, and in that respect, it is in equal parts harrowing and beautiful. And I do also kind of view this as a, a comparison to Voltari, both in that it is its opposite, but I love to, love to find this dynamic with uh, discographies, but this really does feel like the uh, deliverance to Valtari's damnation oh, in that it's this yes. successive I release. Think of that. Shit. I know, right? Like <laughs> paired together, it's the the it's the hardest and softest, but it also, as a result, ends up showing you the distinct like this is why this band is great that if you view this in the context of each other it's just like the 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 different tones and moods they're able to accomplish is just simply wonderful and that fucking opener of uh brennestein which i believe is uh code or code is uh icelandic for uh brimstone uh, a lot of the uh titles on here are very like hard-edged and evocative like obsidian iceberg a uh, storm, uh, electric current, and all of them feel like they perfectly evoke their titles. Um, I want to shout out, other than the opener, which is just like this album condensed into one perfect song, uh, the the third track on here, Isiaki, which ah. is just also, again, one that's the, the Iceberg singles. track. Yeah. One of oh, the greatest the singles. singles. Yeah, this was the second single, oh. and it's like the catchiest song on the album. It's so fucking good. The vocal melodies that Yonzi has on here are are so fucking catchy. And so, like, overall, like, the strings at the very end, they're huge sounding. Like, it, this sounds, like, as upbeat and joyous as stuff on, like, Tack did. And, 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 like, it just kind of boggles the mind that they're able to still sort of evoke these different kind of disparate tones with this harder-edged sound. But my favorite thing on here is probably uh, the title track. Yes! Fuse, or my like, too! Fuck yeah! Uh, and just one of the best fucking songs this band ha have ever made. Yonzi is, like clipping in this fucking the song fucking vocal this, mix it, on this song is insane <laughs> it's like i don't know what they did but it does sound like it's like how when you find out ex or exit music for a film is using like natural reverb and tom york is singing in a staircase it's just like it sounds like they found an abandoned building in iceland and we're just like hey yonzi fucking sing real fucking loud and his echoing croons and like the chorus on here Oh. Yeah, I just, this song has one of my favorite grooves as well it's just like it's so continuous and so like fucking addictive like oh, I, i've listened to this song so much i love it i mean it's pure nine inch nails worship and i oh, am yeah. all here for it and it just ends up being like an album that's sort of like it feels both the furthest away from where they started and also the closest to it and it really just makes you think like you listen to their first album and their last album and it's like they are both similarly very hard edged very you know industrial adjacent almost lo-fi sounding in parts but the definition that they've given to their sound the refinements they've just they've shaved off everything that didn't work about Vaughn and have refined 
channeled, grown, everything about this. This is like the idea. If this ends up being the last Seeger Ross album, I'm more than okay with it. Because frankly, this is one of my favorite entries in their discography because it is just a quintessential like reminder of how versatile this band is. But also, this gives me everything I want out of a Seeger Ross album. There's just no identifiable weak point on here. It's mm. fucking, it's heat front to back. It's one of the most satisfying album experiences they've got. And it's also one of the most immediate, too. Yeah, 100%. I completely agree. Uh, when I first, like, the first initially like spending time with this album when it first came out like i was drawn to the singles brennestein Izaki, uh stormer as well which is a great sort of deep cut mm. one of the most uplifting songs um but and of course the title track as well but the more i've i guess come back to this album the more i've started to appreciate how great the sort of deep cuts are craft and tina mm -hmm. the second song obsidian amazing track beautiful sort of come down but also continuation of the vibe from that opener uh raf straumer the seventh song here is a great deep cut highlight one that's come to be a, a, a special song that i really really yeah. love on this album uh and the understated closer as well is is this quite dark and it's kind of like uh the inverse or like evil version of fiogra piano from the last record because it's a single <laughs> piano this time and it's playing this incredibly doomy sort of like dreary melody that's like the most fucking thickly haunting thing you've ever heard uh and it's such a a kind of hopeless way of ending the album off too it's i mean it's a really really nutso bizarro exciting album that gives you like basically everything you could want from a Sigu Ross album in one respect or another like there are more ambient more kind of like meditative moments like ear furboard um but you still get plenty of punch even in those moments as well uh shout out to the there's some great uh bonus tracks that are more ambient but still worth yeah, checking yeah. out if you are interested in that side as well plus the uh there's a great remix of Brennestein by Blank Mass uh, that I yeah. highly recommend checking out as well, like a 10 minute yep. extended electronic remix that fucking kicks ass. Um, yeah, amazing, amazing album that has been getting the attention it deserves, the love that it deserves. But I agree, if it ended up being their last, I would not be all that upset by that. But this album came out in June of 2013, beautifully well received. And yet we've yet to have a proper follow up to this record. And there are a number of reasons why that is. Uh, some of them, unfortunately, more depressing than others. There have been a number of ambient releases that have been released in the uh, interim experimental projects, the most notable of which is the Route 1 project, which is kind of like conceived as this continuous 24-hour piece of music to soundtrack uh, driving across all of Iceland. Interesting little conceptual idea. Um I had nothing that's really appealed to me all that much. Uh, in 2020 as well, they released uh, Odin's Raven Magic, which is a, a kind of like an ambient uh, orchestral soundtrack to uh, an Icelandic poem, I think, that was kind of like conceived for a stage performance. Um, it hasn't really interested me all that much, but I think it's probably the most notable of all of the releases that mm -hmm. have happened in the interim. Uh, however, there are other reasons why we haven't gotten a, an album proper from Sigur Ross uh, since Gvaker. For one, uh, unfortunately, in 2018, the band's drummer was accused of sexual assault and promptly fired from the band. Um, so they're currently, I believe, without a drummer, although I don't know if that has changed or not since then. Uh, but the, I guess the bright side to that unfortunately dark coin is that Kjartan Svensson did rejoin the band in 2020, and they have signaled that they are working on uh, new music and potentially a new album as well. So they, the end is definitely not uh, necessarily in sight for Sigur Ross, but one thing is for sure, whatever uh, shape their subsequent music takes may well be a strong departure from everything we've heard up to this point. The one other little stopgap thing I want to mention in the interim is that in 2016, and I remember this very distinctly, they released a single called Ovidur that very much mm. followed in 
the industrial sound of Kvaker and kind of started to push it into a new direction. It was quite a divisive song. It has this very distinctive uh, and incredibly abrasive snare tone in it that is mm-hmm. like beyond industrial to like the point of being downright brutal. And it is like, it matches that with some of the ethereal stuff that we've come to expect from the later era of the band as well. It's a curious song. I I, I think it's a great song. I am saddened that we never got the album that this was, I think, supposedly meant mm-hmm. to tease. It never just quite came to fruition. There are different points in which in their career in which they have said that they have started working on a record and then scrapped it because it wasn't coming together. They did that with... Uh, what eventually became Voltari as well. I know in 2010, Yonzi said after a medsud that they were working on a new album and then eventually scrapped it. And the ashes of that project eventually became Voltari. So with all of the, and also another thing that's happened as well is um, the band were accused of tax evasion, not accused, they were convicted of tax <laughs> evasion in 2018 as well. So they've had a- uh, Objectively the coolest crime you can commit as a band. Just a funny thing for a band like Siggy Ross to end up at Broiled in. Uh, so the Icelandic government mm-hmm. have kind of had it out for them, which has made it kind of difficult for them to uh, do anything substantive. So- uh, yeah, it's been a weird sort of period of, of wilderness for Sigur Ross, and they are kind of awaiting a comeback. And we'll see if that arrives. We'll see what shape it takes if it does. But yeah, Jake, any thoughts on um, the interim single Ovidor, but and also like where you might see or want Sigur Ross to head next now that they're kind of drummerless and potentially heading in a more uh, ethereal direction. It seems like they were hinting at something that sounded a little bit distinctly more electronic, too, just because that, like, drop at the very end of that feels almost, like, EDM-inspired in some respects. So, I don't know. I want to see what this would eventually become and seem like, just because this band is constantly reinventing themselves on an album-by-album basis. And just because there has been so much time in between uh now and kviker if we ever do get an album from them i mean it's just like with every passing year it just gets harder and harder to nail down what exactly they're going to sound like Mm -hmm. so i think they are uh you know don't discount them just because they're gonna come back and they're probably gonna come back with something interesting because even though the narrative of this band is sort of like you know they have those legendary albums at the front and then the the reception gets a little bit muted as they go on I still think that it's generally accepted that they haven't really dropped a, a disappointing or bad or mediocre release. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in my eyes, they certainly haven't. So they, they have yet to disappoint me. Mm-hmm. So hopefully they will continue in that stride. But if the narrative ends here, I'm happy it ends here. We have a great discography. Well, one last thing I'll shout out as a stopgap. And I I know you won't have listened to this yet, um, but, or either of these releases yet. But Yonzi has actually subsequently released two solo records uh, in 2020 and 2021. I believe they came out of the same sessions, uh, the most notable of which was 2020 Shiver. And it's so funny, uh, Jake, that you say you bring up EDM influence as a little bit of a potential oh. thing that they might have leaned into with Ovidor, because this album was produced by A.G. Cook uh, of PC Music no fame. shit. Uh, and I will say, uh, I've only listened to this once, and I feel like I want to revisit it to kind of formalize my feelings on it. It's not quite the bubblegum bass, full-on pivot that you might expect, but it, there's definitely... Elizabeth Fraser and Robin are on this album? Yes, what that's right. Fuck? I was going to get to that. Yeah, it's definitely a slightly more adventurous pivot and uh, reasonably tastefully done as well. I feel like this is an album that kind of got a little bit buried when it came out. Um, I still need to revisit it to... F- finalize how i feel about it i was a little bit mixed the first time i heard it but it could be very much like go which i was also mixed on when i first heard it it could well grow on me uh and i think it's a good signal that yonzi at the very least if not the other members of the band have lost none of the creative edge that um you know has sustained them for so long and i still have to check out the second record as well uh that he put out after this obsidian which is apparently more ambient it's rated more highly on radio music so maybe it's a bit of a low-key deep cut highlight too although i know nothing about it um 
I want to dig deeper into this stuff. I have no doubt and no, there's no hesitance in my mind that the members of Sigi Ross have as much creative possibility in them as they ever have. It's just, we've experienced an extended period of time where we've kind of been a bit deprived of that. So we'll see yeah, what yeah. happens. Uh, my feeling is because Yonzi put out a solo record in 2020 and 2021 that it's kind of been a little bit of, of a wilderness period where they've, the members of Sigur Ross have kind of just been doing their own thing for a bit and we may see them very much gearing up to release a new album, maybe even next year. There's been some whispers that if they have started recording, we may potentially get a record as soon as 2023. So we'll see what that happens. Obviously, if that does, if slash when, that does happen we will be reviewing it on the jams and tea podcast no mm -hmm. question so yeah there's i think plenty of reasons to still be excited about sigi ross and yonzi and what remains uh, even though it has been some time since um i mean it's going to be kuvaker is going to turn 10 next year for christ's sake so we'll see what happens but yeah that brings us to the present day with sigi ross and of course as we do at the end of each of these discography breakdowns it's now time for jake and i to talk about uh our, our album rankings and our favorite songs lists as well uh why don't we start with album rankings uh first of all jake what is your album ranking for sigi ross i have included their live album any in my ranking because i wanted to i also included go as well just because yeah. number 10 i have Vaughn, number nine, I have a good beginning. Number eight, I have Barf Heim. Number seven, I have Go. Number six, I have Thanks. Number five, I have Eni. Number four, Brackets. Number three, Medsud. Number two, Gviker. And number one, Valtari. Wow, the one and two being like both of those two most recent records is a real like, obviously they were the first two you heard, but like still, I love that. I love the energy of that. I, I didn't expect Kaviker to be that high, but overall I was just like, yeah, damn, God. Hmm. Oof. Fuck, yeah. My album ranking, uh, I didn't put any on my list, but it is a great album, uh, a great live record, a great document of how they sound in that environment. So definitely gets a recommendation from me. Uh, number nine is Vaughn. Uh, number eight, I'll put Varf uh, as an EP. Uh, number seven is Medsud e Eram Ved Spielem in the last. <laughs> Again, an album I do think is a great record, so it's amazing that it's not higher. Number six, mm -hmm. Go. Love that album. Number five, Kvaker. Number four, Valtari. Number three, Tuck. Number two, Agaitis Birgen, a good beginning. And number one, parentheses my favorite Sigur Rós album all right now our favorite Sigur Rós songs now I prepared 20 because I couldn't stop myself but if you've only got 10 that's fine I'll let you go first number 10 I have Ralph's Rummer number nine I have Virar Vel Tilothrasa number eight All Right number seven Brennestein, number six, Arabatur, number five, Kvaiker, number four, Varuo, number three, Glosoli, number two, Untitled Three, and number one, Eki Mook. Wow, uh, that's a, a great top 10 full of unconventional picks. Love it. Uh, my favorite songs, again, I did 20 because I'm extra. Uh, I'm just going to count them all down. Number 20 is Dauda Logan from Valtari. Number 19 is Med Sudi Eram. Number 18 is Brennestein. Number 17 is Varud from Valtari. Number 16 is Untitled Six or Ebo from parentheses. Number 15 is the title track from Agatis Birgen. Number 14 is Festival. Number 13 is Fjogar Piano. Number 12 is title track from Kivaker. Number 11 is Half Soul version from uh, Hvarf. Number 10 is Untitled 4 or Nios Navelin, the nothing song. Number 9 
is Vidrar Velti Loftaraza. Number eight is Ini Mir Singer Vitli Singer from Midsud. Number seven is Iki Muk. Number six is Pop Lajid, Untitled Eight from parentheses. Number five is Gong. Number four is Sai Gloper from Tuck. Number three, Untitled Three from brackets Samskiti. Uh, number two, Svefin G. Englar from Against Aspersion. And my number one, as always, what else could it be? Glossoli from Tuck. And that brings us to the end of our full discography breakdown for Sigur Ross. Let us know at home what you think of this band, what this band means to you, how you would rank their records, what standouts exist in this discography, what things you want to give some shine to. If anything, we obviously couldn't mention everything in the extended universe of this band, but we do want to hear what they mean to you and what records you love the most in the comments below. Let us know what you thought of our dissection and our discussion as well. We want to hear your feedback too. That really, really helps us to continue improving and doing this as best as we can. We will be back with more videos. We release videos every Sunday, Wednesday, and Friday on this channel. So if you're new to the channel, discovering us through this video, consider subscribing if you want to hear more great music discussion from people who are as passionate as we are. And of course, if you enjoyed this video as well, please consider giving it a like too. That helps a lot. If you want to go above and beyond and support us even further, become one of the members of the Jams and Tea family. You can hit the join button for just $1 a month. Support us directly. Get your name in the title crawl of every video on this channel. Plus, if you want to recommend us music to listen to and talk about, your recommendation will go to the top of the pile. As always, though, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Disneyland, the happiest place on earth. <laughs>